From atop the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world, this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome each and every one of you to tonight's show across North America on our terrestrial affiliates and digitally on TalkStream Live and Revolution Radio. If you want to take a listen to our archives, we have them free for you at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do me the favor. Hit that subscribe button follow us on twitter at spaced out radio for the show and my personal handle at dave scott sor our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you rock out to bumblefoot read up on captain shirk's sor newswire and much more Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. I tell you, each and every one of you listening tonight is in for a real treat because there are very few people in this field that I hold in a very, very high regard, and two of them are here tonight. For instance, if I was to name my top five researchers out there, these two would be on the list in Timothy Renner and Joshua Cutchin. They're both honest researchers. They write from their heart. They write from passion. They write from the research and the evidence that shows the way it is supposed to be done. They remind me a lot of guys like David Weatherly and John Tenney. All right. Micah Hanks. That would probably be my top five with these two included. And then they've got this great book. They say the forests out there seem to be hiding much more complex things than an undiscovered gorilla. Bigfoot may be howling from a lonely mountaintop, but the Bigfoot phenomena is whispering secrets. Now all we have to do is listen. Researchers and authors Timothy Renner and Joshua Cutchin have teamed up for an amazing book and an amazing look at Sasquatch. Their new book, which can be found on Amazon... Where the Footprints End, High Strangeness and the Bigfoot Phenomena, Volume 1. We're going to bring them on here momentarily. Then at the bottom of hour number three, I will bring you the SOR Newswire, brought to you by Paranoia Magazine. Mr. Timothy Renner, Mr. Joshua Cutchin, a pair of power beards, all here <laughs> in one place. I am very much looking forward to this. How are you guys doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Dave? I'm great, man. I'm absolutely great. And, you know, Tim, uh, just for our audience, if you haven't seen a picture of Tim, he's got fantastic hair, too. This is a great mane, all right? And and I literally had to put my hair down just so I could, you know, try and show it off and maybe compete. I'm a definitely a bronze medal to his silver and gold because he wins them oh, both. But, but I appreciate thanks. it, guys. I appreciate it. And, you know, for our audience who may not get to know you, Tim, or may not know you very well, let's get to know you a little bit. You've been doing this a long time. You've had this uh, innate ability to carve a career looking for the paranormal, the supernatural, and the mystic out there. How did you get started in all of this? Oh, boy. I guess it was a gradual slippery slope that started with a a useful interest in what would have been folklore but i wouldn't have known it was called that when i was a kid i just thought i'd like cool stuff i like ghost stories i like monsters and then when i heard that uh you know things like uh ghosts were real and there was real ghosts you know nearby i had to go see where these ghosts were where you know where the where the haunted houses and then when i saw that patterson gimlin film went in search of i just uh about went nuts as a kid and just it was all bigfoot uh from then on for me as, as a kid did you ever think that you would have your own encounters to show that these creatures were real growing up? Um, yeah, I don't know. I think I think I hope for it. And uh, I mean, even today, I I hesitate to say what I've encountered, only that it's been something very, very strange. I, you know, it's it's that's kind of one of the points we make in this book is if you don't see it it's hard to say it's a Bigfoot because a lot of these things uh, sound like poltergeist activity, for instance, with bad smells and weird sounds and feelings of being scared and knocking. Uh, these are all phenomena that, that accompany uh, poltergeist encounters too. So experiencing stuff like that in the woods, you know, before uh, I would probably say, yeah, I, th- these were Bigfoot encounters. Now, 
their encounters with something and and uh, that's as far as i can go but uh it's very rewarding it's very exciting uh to to be involved in that absolutely whether it's bigfoot or something else absolutely joshua we bring you in here not only are you a great writer and a great researcher but man one of my dreams is to see you play your tuba in the middle of the british columbia forest to see if we can attract bigfoot man you know that's that's worked with uh, there's a great video of um this guy who's playing for for alligators in florida He's playing his tuba and he's playing all these like low pedal notes and for some reason the, the frequency is setting all the uh, all the alligators off. But uh, dude, that would be so much fun. I was out in L.A. a while back and uh, we were uh, trying to uh, make it out with me and the tuba to the Integratron. Uh, if you're familiar with that at all, it's the uh, it's the giant uh, it's the giant sort of acoustic acoustic um resonator building slash that that contactee george van tassel set up out in the middle of the california desert because apparently it has these great acoustics it's but no didn't get to happen um but uh you know you're talking about how how much time tim spends in the field and i think that's 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 one of the reasons among many why why we seem to complement each other really well is because um he's one of the few people who's comfortable talking about stuff in the field and, you know, also going through really, really old books and finding references in folklore here and there. Uh, and you know, that's, that's, it's been a blind spot for me for a while is that I don't do enough of that sort of field work stuff, which I really want to, I was actually ironically supposed to get into a little bit more before the pandemic hit back in March. But, uh, yeah, uh, I wouldn't work with just anybody, but I, I, I am, Joshua Kutchin and I support this message. Tim Renner for Congress. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, Josh, I want to I want to kind of focus on you here for for a quick second because uh, Tim has been doing this for a long time, and and you know, I think you you would agree with me that there are very few well rounded researchers in this entire field who who really seem to do it right and really seem to to grasp everything they may have their own beliefs of what is happening but if the evidence says different even though they may not believe it they're going down that road as well how much of a mentor has somebody like tim been for you as you know i mean you're relatively new like i am to this field compared to a guy like tim yeah no it's it's definitely one of the situations where uh you know i Tim definitely is in that same uh, category for me as people like uh, like Greg Bishop um, and uh, you know some of these other people who have really just reached out to me and really you know I'll put Patrick Weege in that in that category too of people who not only are not completely married to their ideas but when they're confronted with um, you know evidence that speaks to the contrary or or another exciting way of thinking they don't reject it. Um, you know, also people who read a bunch of stuff that they disagree with, <laughs> you know, uh, but, you know, um, spiritually, politically, paranormally, <laughs> I think that's something that we need a lot more of in every aspect of our lives. Um, it's just, it's people, people are not, people are bigger fans of echo chambers than ever before. And, uh, you know, I think somebody who's always trying to be, trying to, to gut check and be intellectually honest is the kind of person who says, you know, well, does this pet theory of mine really <clears throat> actually hold up when confronted with conflicting evidence? And for some reason, the paranormal slash supernatural field is is plenty rife with people who have their minds completely made up about things that aren't even proved to be real in the first place. And I say as this, this is somebody who you know believes that there's an objective reality to a lot of this stuff. Um, but yeah, there there are a lot of people who treat this whole thing. A lot more dogmatically uh, than I is my is my go to uh, is my go that they treat a lot more dogmatically than I would. And, and I think Tim definitely falls in that category as well. Tim, I'm, I'm sure you're a guy who has heard a lot of compliments about the way you do things over the years. How did you develop your style of just being that open minded? Because for so many people out there, they're highly critical of what they research what they want to research what they refuse to research 
And, you know, that seems to be a real battle in this field. Yet someone like yourself, you know, you may have your own feelings, but you allow the evidence to take you where it needs to go. How were you able to fall on that path where so many haven't? Oh, my. Uh, Wow. (laughs) It's a hard question. I think um, for me, I, I just let it takes me let it take me where where it's going to go i i uh you know i i kind of had to sit down with myself at some point and uh after a very depressing period i i i actually entered a, a very long uh, kind of depression when i realized that i'm probably not going to solve this stuff i'm probably not going to see it solved in my lifetime and at the end of this period of time kind of sat down with myself and said well do you still like it? Are you still interested in it? Do you, do you still want to be involved in it? And the answer to all those things was yes. And so I think at that point, um, I just kind of settled in and said, you know, let, let me see where this goes. And, you know, I think there, for me, I, I often, not always, but I often kind of try to put myself in the middle of it. Cause I think it's a very human thing that these, the, these encounters with, the paranormal, what what I call the other, generically, whatever these other things are, it's a very human thing. It's part of the human experience, I think. And I, you know, I put boots on the ground, and and I'm I'm following in footsteps of you know great researchers like like Stan Gordon, for instance. And uh, Stan tends to just document what happened, and that's super valuable. He will, you know, what did the witness see? What did the witness hear? You know, what did he find? What were their footprints? Whatever, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Where I'm, I tend to just jump in the middle and see what I experience as well as a witness. And uh, it, for me, it's it's a more holistic thing, I think. And, and I, I tend to get this view from the inside and hopefully from the outside. And hopefully I'm not too biased, but uh, that's that tends to be my approach. Yeah, it's it's funny. As long as we're having sort of the mutual <laughs> mutual admiration society thing going on around here, um, I I think that, uh, and I would probably lump from what I know of the way that you you know behave, Dave. I'd probably lump you in this category as well. Is that uh, you know the reason that I also get along with Tim is that I, I think he's reached that gnostic moment that a lot of us have when we're interested in these things, where we like we come to grips with the fact that we will probably never have any definite definitive answers in our own lifetimes you know if 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 that's why you're doing this man if you're wanting to get to the end of that rainbow you're sadly mistaken (laughs) yeah be prepared for disappointment yeah exactly yeah well, as uh, you know, as we look, though, there is that other side of the coin as science Bob says in the chat room, which is accomplishment because you never know we could be miles away or we could be right on the doorstep at the precipice of finding something guys. Yeah. But I, th- I think that if, um, well, you know, I think a couple things and I realize that this isn't quite the way that progress or statistics work, but I don't know how much we know more of now than we did about some of these topics than we did 70 years ago. And it's also, you know, almost for me, it's almost like, uh, <laughs> the pessimist is never disappointed as well. <laughs> it's a little bit of that. Um, but also, I mean, just, it's almost like, you know, I think that there's something even kind of zen about the idea of letting go of that sort of attachment. Um, because man, some people do fetishize it. That's for sure. Well, you know, and, and, you know, I don't want it to be a love-in, okay? And that's not the reason why you guys are here, so we could blow a bunch of sunshine up each other's butts. But the reason (laughs) why I wanted to start off the show this way, guys, is one thing that I always try to teach my listeners, okay, is I try and bring on credible people. I try to bring on people who are knowledgeable, who are open-minded, who don't play games, who are are there researching for the right reasons, whatever those reasons may be. And, and that's why I, I really admire both of you, along with guys like Micah Hanks, David Weatherly, and John Tenney, because the door is always open. It's always open to the realm of possibility. And I don't see you guys cutting down people on social media. I don't see you guys, you know, firing up opinion or or self-titling yourself 
in order to to make your your resume look a little bit bigger and better. I see you guys doing what you naturally do, and that is work hard. And when we try and book our guests for this show, that's one of the things we strive to do, to get is those people who have open minds who are open to the possibilities of things happening. And that is very, very difficult, Josh, to find in this field because so many people feel they need to have an opinion and they will do anything to defend that opinion. It doesn't matter what the evidence says. And that's why I find it kind of difficult, you know, but this is why I find it also a little bit of a breath of fresh air because my audience gets to benefit from learning from you guys. They may pick up your books. They may look at the YouTube videos or other interviews that you've done, and they may be able to find some answers because you guys took the time to be honest and upfront about what you're doing. And that's what I really appreciate about you guys. You know, Thank the, the, you. I mean, yeah, I don't know. I'm speaking for Tim here, but uh, as well, but like, man, for, for me, like the co ultimate compliment wouldn't be that somebody picked up any of my ideas and ran with them, but rather that someone used some of my ideas to come up with something completely new. Like that to me would be the ultimate compliment. I don't know how Tim feels, but that, that to me is like, oh, you're thinking for yourself, you're synthesizing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. There's some ideas that we touch on this book that I think are going to take a life of their own and expand beyond what we've put down. I think we've laid the groundwork here and uh, I very much look forward to seeing where that goes. And before we get any further away from that, that uh, list of researchers you put us in company with uh, John Tenney, Micah Hanks, um, uh, David Weatherly, who was the other one? Uh, uh, the other two were uh, uh, Joshua Cutchin and Tim Renner. That's my top five. <laughs> Well, in, in any case, that uh, great honor to be listed amongst them. So th th I didn't want to skip over that point. That I think Josh would feel the same. Yeah, yeah that's very true. You know, I, I, I just look at it, you know, I mean, when you have the ability, whether it's me, whether it's you or anybody to learn off of what we're doing, that's all we can do. Like, I'm not a researcher. I'm going into the field this weekend to go look for, for Sasquatch my buddy Mark and I, and we have a gifting site. We have an ad action in th almost three years there. We got to go see and if the, they finally came back. We don't know, but we have another area that we want to check out. And I think when, when I have the ability to listen to the way, let's say the five of you are doing things, that's the way I want to go. Because I don't want to be narrow-minded. I don't want to say Sasquatch is a gigantopithecus. There's no way that it can be anything supernatural. And Bob's your uncle, and that's the answer. And eliminate possibility. Nothing scientific if you're not researching it. That's, well, that's, a, that's what a I lot, love. That's a lot of what we're kind of fighting against in a way in this book. That People tend to start with a conclusion, i.e., Sasquatch is a is an ape or a mm -hmm. elk hominid, and then they yep. work backwards from there. And I'd like to say they they build the uh, verbal Rube Goldberg devices basically to try to reason how these strange things associated with the fauna, how, how a natural creature could do these strange things. And uh, it's, I mean, for the guys that, that claim to be on the side of science, and you know, I, that's not really a claim Josh and I make. I think we both probably consider ourselves more folklorists and. <laughs> leaning towards maybe the, the Jungian side of things. Yeah, definitely. Um, but uh, for the other side, you know, there's, there's guys that, for the what we term the flesh and blood hypothesis in the book, they claim to be hard science, and they that's really not good science, to, to start at a conclusion and work backwards. It, you no, know, I, there's I, this, I think you're yeah. right. Go ahead, Josh. Oh, oh no, I was just going to say that, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's one thing to... I would even say it's one thing to start at a conclusion and to cherry pick, but then when people confront you with things that don't fit that model, don't try to do this Rube Goldberg thing. Just be like, you know what? I can't explain that. Like one of the one of the things that I constantly run into is I think that personally, everything involved with the alien contact experience um, is very consistent with the fairy contact experiences that have happened, you know, in, in histories worldwide, but particularly Western Europe. But at the same time, even though I'm super sympathetic to that worldview and or to that interpretation, rather, 
um, you know, I'll be, I'll be damned if I can explain some of these structured craft in terms of those fairy things without kind of getting a little Rube Goldbergy myself. So the ability to sit there with the, uh, you know, as, as, uh, as Terrence McKenna would say to sit there with the messiness of the mystery, I think is something that, uh, you know, I think is actually quite healthy, even though a lot mm-hmm. of, a lot of people in the world today aren't, aren't, aren't happy with that ambiguity. I think it's a very healthy place to be, honestly. Hey, Tim, I got a message from you from my buddy Mark, who's listening in. And he plays the mandolin and the banjo as well. And he wants you to come up to British Columbia, and we'll take you to one of our Sasquatch spots where we've had encounters before. And he wants to have uh, dueling banjos with you just to see (laughs) if we can attract some Sasquatch with that. All right. All right. I'm I'm, uh, old-timey style, Quellhammer style, so we'll we'll work that in there. Maybe maybe the... uh... The like a little Appalachian style up in the BC. I'd love it. I'd absolutely love it. Gentlemen, we got about just over 90 seconds here before we have to go to break in at the bottom of the hour here on Space Down Radio. Timothy Renner and Joshua Cutchin are with us tonight. You know, let's let's start off with the with the Sasquatch talk here, and uh, you know, let's let's get into this. What? Why are we so attracted, Tim, to this monster, to this creature? Well, I think they've lived next to us, whatever they are, whatever these things are, they've lived next to us all around the world for as long as we've been keeping record. Every culture has a wild man in the, in the woods or in the mountains next to them, sometimes even in the desert next to them. Every culture seems to have a wild man. And uh, I think we've always been fascinated with whatever these things are, and uh, they have a lot of common features all over the world. And of course, people often point out that, you know, there's different names for them all over the world, but uh, there's also different uh, sort of folkloric similarities all over the world. And that's what we get into a lot of in the book. And I think uh, people have always been fascinated and always will be with this, this wild man that, uh, that, like I said, has always lived next to us. And yet he is the world's hide and seek champion. This is yeah. the irony of this all. Uh, that's part of it. That's part of it. Uh, I I don't uh, I don't think we get to roll a body into a lab ever, uh, and I could be proven wrong one day. But uh, I'm laying my money on all of history, and uh, so far we haven't rolled one into a lab yet. Well, I hope so. And you know what? In a, in a strange way, I hope that continues. I really do, because, you know, we're going to get into a lot about Sasquatch tonight. And there aren't many books I recommend. This one I do with our guests tonight, Joshua Cutchin and Timothy Renner. It's brand new on Amazon. Where the Footprints End, High Strangeness and the Bigfoot Phenomena, Volume 1, Folklore. Get it on Amazon today. We'll be back. We're going to learn all about the big hairy beast that they call Mark Spender. No, that's my buddy. I mean Bigfoot. Right after this. Hey, space travelers. This is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you'd know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. From the heartlands of Canada to beards around the world, we know how to take care of you. Fill your follicles with the Mighty Moose Beard Oil. All our oils and bombs are handmade and 100% natural ingredients because we care about your beard. And hey, use the promo code SOR2019 and get your Mighty Moose Beard Oil today. You can check us out on our website, MightyMooseBeard.com. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. 
You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is watching. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. Hey everybody, the SOR Space Travelers is open. For just five bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members-only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great forum for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com. You wanted new SOR gear, and now you can have it. The SOR Vault is fully stocked with t-shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and everything in between with great logos for you to choose from. So head on over to spacedoutradio.com, click on the SOR Vault, and go shopping. Pricing is quite affordable, and you can look good representing your favorite show. So go to our website and pick up your new SOR wear at the SOR Vault today. If you like it hot, real hot then heat up your meals with bumblefoot hot sauce get your bumblefoot hot sauce today the sauce bumblelicious and the four million scoville unit bumble we're going in hot real hot coming out even hotter keep the milk nearby and tantalize your taste buds tonight bumblefoot hot sauce available now at kajans.com Cold drinks, great food, and the best music in Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is the place to be, open until 2 a.m. nightly. Everything on the menu starts at just $6.95. Who serves food that cheap anymore? At the Moose, you'll never know who you'll run into. Rock stars, actors, athletes, it's the place everyone wants to be. So join us at the Moose Vancouver, the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Hello, Space Travelers. It's me again, Carl. Don't forget to join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month. And follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Our Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. Our Facebook page is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Come woo it up with Spaced Out Radio today. Bye. Are you looking for great advertising value for your company? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. We have a multitude of places to get your name out there, including commercial ads during the show, special promotions, and banners on our website. Our audience has proven to support the companies that support our show. We can make your budget work for you. For more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. At spacedoutradio.com, we are keeping you up to date on all the news with the SOR Newswire. Captain Shirk leads the team that is bringing you the news of the day and exclusive stories on everything paranormal and supernatural. It's free to read, it's updated daily, and it's right there for you. The SOR Newswire is a one-stop shop for the news of the day. Check it out at spacedoutradio.com today. Need that weekend supernatural fix? Look no further than Spaced Out Saturday right here at spacedoutradio.com. I'm Stacy Edwards. And I'm John Edwards. Each Saturday night, Stacy and I are going to bring you the best in paranormal, cryptids, UFOs, you name it, and we're going there. It's all about the experience and to share the knowledge with all of you. So tune us in every Saturday night on Spaced Out Saturdays starting at 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, only at spacedoutradio.com. We're taking Sunday nights out of this world on Spaced Out Radio. This is Michael W. Hall, also known as the Paranormal Lawyer. Together, we're going to go on an exciting journey into the unknown. 
I'm going to bring you some of the best interviews in the paranormal and supernatural to start your new week off on a freaky note. So tune in to Spaced Out Sundays with me, Michael W. Hall, only on SpacedOutRadio.com. Welcome back to the second half hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters, still watching the blue sky outside. Oh, I love that. Absolutely love that. Hey, I want to remind all of you that if you've missed portions of this show or others, you can check out our free archives at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you. Just do me the favor, hit that subs or yeah, follow Captain Jerk's Newswire, rock out to Bumblefoot, go have some fun there. And, of course, on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, you can follow us there. And my personal handle, at Dave Scott SOR. Tonight, we are talking with authors and co-authors, Timothy Renner, Joshua Cutchin. They got a great book on Amazon, brand new out, called Where the Footprints End, High Strangeness and the Bigfoot Phenomena, Volume 1, Folklore. And we're going to get deep, deep, deep into Bigfoot tonight. Gentlemen, welcome back to the show. Great. Good to be here. Yeah. All right. Bigfoot. Tim, what's your impression of what this big hairy monster is? Mm, see, that's the tricky question. Um, I think it's real. I want to be clear about that. I think when people see it, it's absolutely real. And it absolutely leaves footprints. And it leaves hair. And leaves scat. And uh, occasionally even attacks people. But I do not think it's an undiscovered gorilla I do not think it's a relic hominid. I think it's something far more complex than that and far weirder than that. Uh, so what it is, I'm not going to lay a, a title on that. And I think that we don't say that in either volume of this book, volume one or volume two, you're not going to find a spot where Josh or I says, this is an interdimensional creature. You know, Bigfoot was dropped here from a UFO from the planet Xenon or Anything like that, uh, we remain pretty agnostic. Um, at this point, I, I feel like it really has a strong connection with uh, what Jung would call the wild man archetype. And again, this gets into funny territory because when you talk about things like archetypes, I think people often think you're talking about something that isn't real, something that's imaginary. And uh, that's absolutely not the case. Again, you know, I've talked to enough witnesses, I've stared them in their face, that have seen these things, that have terrified them, that has affected them for their whole life uh, after their sighting. They are real, they are physical, they are there, but uh, there's something very, very strange about them. You, you know, are in the minority. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Josh, and then I'll ask a question. Go ahead. At the same time, I think there, there's also a contingent of people who think that archetypes are too physical and too real. You know, it's like people talk about the trickster as if it's some sort of like literal demigod as opposed to, you know, there's this term that consciousness researchers who I believe, <laughs> those of whom I believe are on the wrong side of science, um, like to talk about, it's called epiphenomena, which is this idea that consciousness doesn't actually exist. Your consciousness is an epiphenomena that theoretically any comparably complex, uh, system will like as complex as the human brain, will sort of have consciousness emerge as an epiphenomena. Another way to think of this is that, you know, sand dunes don't actually exist. They're an epiphenomena of particle physics and, uh, and wind. And I always think that the only thing, you know, but I don't, well, I don't think that consciousness is an epiphenomena. I feel like the sort of phys physicalization or reification or there's something about that idea that is really useful to, in terms of the archiman, archetype, um, a wild man archetype or any, any archetype really, you know, just because there isn't a literal physical archetype of the mother doesn't mean that it doesn't exist and it doesn't manifest itself all the time and things like the hospitality industry or, or, uh, you know, the medical industry, you know, that, that, that concept of nurturing and caring. But, uh, 
you know, I'm, I'm also with Tim, like this thing has a physical component. Um, the way that I tend to think of it is that, uh, you know, there are plenty of, plenty of non-physical things, which, especially in the world of the paranormal, that, that exhibit physical attributes in our environment. I mean, you know, ghosts slam doors and leave footprints and poltergeists can be, you know, can actually manifest rocks if you, if you're, you know, if you believe in that stuff. Similarly, psi phenomena, which has a robust history of, of, uh, progressing towards becoming, you know, an affirmed reality is the, the, the very definition of non-physical phenomena that can interact with our physical world. So thinking of, you know, what, what Tim likes to call these um, these secondary relics like footprints and, and scat and hair, thinking of those more akin to some sort of, again, reification like an alien implant, like uh, angel hair from you know UFO sites, like something like ectoplasm. Thinking of them in those terms, I think, is pretty useful. Um, and then to finally circle back around to you know the sort of the guiding ethos of this book. Uh, I said on a couple of different conversations that I've had with people that if, if you're looking for us to come in with, yeah, with all evidence and a thesis at the end, don't know if I can do that. You know, we got this, we were, we were fortunate enough to have a, uh, a blurb for it, for the book provided to us by Patrick Harper, author of Demonic Reality, which is one of my and Tim's favorite books. And he was like, well, what's, what's your primary thesis? And I'm like, Bigfoot's weird. <laughs> it's about as specific as we get because what we're doing is is we're, we're viewing this, especially in volume one, we're just basically pointing out weirdness and we're pointing out the residences with all these different, uh, you know, folklore traditions that when you put them together, they really don't mesh. But at the same time, aspects, but at the same time, aspects of the, you know, of the Bigfoot phenomena resonate clearly with fairy folklore, resonate clearly with the alien contact experience, resonate clearly with magic, um, interdimensional ideas, ghosts, like these different bodies of folklore all speak to the Bigfoot phenomena as a whole. And at the end, it's sort of almost like a choose your own adventure. Like which, which one do you think is, you know, the closest aligns with, uh, with, with the Bigfoot phenomena. It really is a Monty Hall kind of thing. Which door do you want to go? Number one, number two, or number three? Right? But but yeah. I mean I, I I mean that in all due respect because I have always thought that there was something supernatural about Bigfoot. And the reason why is because I grew up in an area where there was a lot of First Nations, and that was, you know, part of their folklore and legend is that this animal is either a shapeshifter or an interdimensional type being. And that's kind of the way I leaned. And then I had my own experience, which to me confirmed that. And yet, well, and, and, and go ahead. No, I was just going to say, well, that's something that's, that's, that's really quite frustrating is a lot of the, the cryptozoological you know, rank and file who are, who are supporters of this flesh and blood hypothesis will often make, you know, declarations that native Americans, which are almost universally talked about in a lot of this literature as the monolith, which they obviously are not, um, but you know, Native Americans air brackets um, always feel that it's a physical creature, but they they very rarely say that you know. Well, most of them think it's a spiritual creature. It's a physical creature. Not all of them, by a long shot. And even amongst those tribes that um, believe that it is a physical creature, there's almost always some sort of interjection of like you're alluding to this weirdness that uh, that is conveniently left out of a lot of these books that are that are, you know, banging the uh, wood ape hypothesis. Absolutely. I mean, but how do we keep an open mind? Because, you know, a lot of researchers, to play devil's advocate here for a second, a lot of researchers, okay, don't believe in the supernatural. They don't believe in ghosts. They believe everything is a living being because maybe that's what their experience told them, Josh. So how do we knock their research if they're not willing to open up their minds to what they haven't experienced themselves. Well, yeah, I don't want to come across as, as being too antagonistic. Um, <clears throat> I, I do think that there is a rough correlation that, that Tim pointed out to me where the more longitudinal interactions are the ones that tend to get really strange. So if someone has a roadside crossing or someone is out hunting in the woods, they're more, much more likely to see activity that looks like a primate and ascribe it to being a primate. And look, I mean, it's certainly, certainly by far, I would be, it would, I would be really, really dishonest if I said that we don't have 
something in the woods that is acting in many ways just like a giant primate. I mean, you know, you've got stuff from even the overt stuff like hooting and, um, you know, leaving behind footprints that have dermal ridges and mid-tarsal breaks and, you know, uh, even stuff that's even more subtle like, uh, you know, some of, the, some of the genital size described in some Sasquatch reports and also some, you know, examples of people noting pillow erection, you know, pillow erection, the idea that the hair of the Bigfoot actually stands on end when it's agitated. These are all things that have a basis in primate anatomy. At the same time, uh, you know, you get people who tend to be habituators, and a lot of their experiences seem really mired in a lot of this activity that looks just as much like poltergeist activity, like, you know, this this archetype of the <clears throat> the woman in white that Tim found out. Um, you know, so, so I, it's, it would be absolutely dishonest to say that we don't see Bigfoot doing primatological things. Um, you know, the, the sort of gateway that I've sort of wondered about is... Um, if you look at the work of someone like Mike Clellan, like Mike makes no bones about the fact that there are physical owls, but at the same time, that imagery of the physical owl might be adopted by whatever lies behind the UFO phenomena as a sort of mask. And I'm a little bit, I'm at least a little bit sympathetic to the idea that we might be looking at two different phenomena here. Something that really is a, a small, very small population of an undiscovered hominid and something that wears the mask of the undiscovered hominid that is the same other that lies behind a lot of these paranormal phenomena at the same time, you know, um, if there is something that's drawing upon our collective unconscious or there is some aspect of co-creation to these phenomena, who's to say that, uh, something isn't sort of whatever lies behind the Bigfoot phenomena, this other that wears this mask isn't sort of drawing upon this archetype as well. That's, that's my very long winded two cents. Uh, t Tim, you got it. You want to say, I, I have anything to add to that? Yeah. I think my advice to, to, you know, get back to Dave's question is to like sort of how to, um, kind of shake these researchers, um, from, uh, from their, you know, their hard position is I would say, just wait, because you're going to run into something weird. You're going to run into weird lights in the woods where you're looking for Bigfoot, or you're going to run into uh, something you can't explain, something very, very strange. And I would just say, if they're going to be honest, they're going to say, oh, that's weird. I can't explain that. And not, uh, you know, for instance, the, the trackways that, that end in the middle of fields. I've heard a number of ridiculous explanations as to why these trackways just end these these long trackways of footprints will just end in the middle of the field uh the my favorite is when they say that the bigfoot turns around and tiptoes backwards in its own tracks i, I love imagining this great giant ape man delicately tiptoeing back through his, through his tracks so as not to mess them up um but uh you know they're confronted with this very very strange thing uh and if they're honest with themselves after a while they're just going to not be able to deny the weirdness because there's no shortage of it. We've, we've got, uh, one of the things I was told, um, when I got into Bigfoot research by, uh, flesh and blood types was that, uh, yeah, weird stuff happens, but it's not, it, it doesn't really happen that much around Bigfoot. It's, it really doesn't happen that often. And, uh, I'd say that's absolutely false. We've got, uh, two very, very, very thick volumes just filled with account after account after account of weird stuff happening around Bigfoot. And uh, most of the people I talk to, even people who are convinced it's just an undiscovered primate of some sort, will slip into something weird with it. Usually it's the lights. That's the most common thing. But uh, often you'll get some other things. And uh, so I would say to any researcher who, you know, just wait, something weird will happen. And then you're going to have to account for that. Why does so much weird happen during one of these encounters? A lot of the encounters seem to happen virtually by mistake, yet people have had encounters with Bigfoot where all of a sudden, right before or after, they see orbs, they see UFOs, they feel other presences around. Why does this seem to happen, in your opinion, Tim? Yes, it's opinion only. You know, I, I, the, the truthful answer would be who knows. Uh, but I would say it's an aspect of like what I said, you know, the other. It's expressing itself. So visually you might get this wild man. At the same time you get, uh, you know, mind speak, for instance. But a lot of people talk about mind speak. So they'll get this voice in their head. So you get these 
these dual weird phenomena. And uh, I always say, you know, it's, it's really intellectually dishonest to if you see like a weird light in the woods and then you see Bigfoot to disconnect those two things to say, well, they're not related. Uh, I, I just, how how rare is it to see a weird light in the woods and how rare is it to see a Sasquatch to see them both at the same time or in a you know relatively uh, close together. I mean, you, you have to at least note that uh, these two weird things happened. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's I think it's just an expression of the whole oddity of of the phenomenon. And it's the way the other interacts with us in many ways. And, and I would agree with you on that. Do you think that Sasquatch, Tim, looks to interact with us or do you think it tries to get away from us? I think uh, many times, whatever it is, it's it's happy to interact with us on its terms, which are unknown to us. We don't really know the motivations behind it. And uh, capricious, they can change on a dime. And that's true with a lot of supernatural phenomena. Again, this is something that's true across the board. Some very things, things that can start out very, you know, seemingly innocent or benevolent even can uh, turn on a dime and become very, very dark and strange uh, that, you know, many people have had uh, this combination of, you know, alien experiences from the, you know, revelatory to the funny, to the absolutely terrifying. And, you know, often it'll be the, the same people that have had these, these experiences. So, um, yeah, I, I think it, I think it desires some form of interaction with us. Uh, but again, it's, it's on its own terms, wh- whatever they may be. <laughs> Right. Josh, I want to bring you in here. I mean, as someone who is going through this book with Tim, he has all this experience, all of these stories built up, and you're still building your own uh, repertoire and your own knowledge and and research on this. What did you learn most about writing this book regarding the creature of Sasquatch? That's an absolutely great question. Um, at the risk of at the risk of continuing both the mutual admiration society and maybe jumping into something that we might not want to jump into too early, man, I always keep on coming back to this this woman in white connection that Tim found out simply because I wasn't opposed to it, but I was just absolutely convinced that he was barking up the wrong tree, that there wasn't really anything to it, that he was sort of conflating the two, and he just found some stuff out that blew my mind that suggests that there's been this connection literally, you know, in, in, you know, Western European folklore traditions of this wild man, woman and white tradition. That's, that really is, it's just absolutely baked into these two archetypes. They're, they're joined at the hip and, um, man, oh man, that I think that there was nothing to it, but I think that's, that's what this book is going to be remembered for is, is Tim figuring all that out and somehow having that light bulb moment and it's you know it's it's absolutely fantastic and i can pretty confidently say that no one's really talked about this at least in this capacity uh like tim has okay but for you personally did you believe going into this what were your preconceived notions going into this about bigfoot and what what is your your new outlook on sasquatch now well so i mean i was always convinced that there were um these little these little connections here and there with other folkloric entities, but I didn't quite realize. I tell you what, I didn't realize. I didn't realize how much overlap there was between poltergeists and fairies and witches and ghosts. I mean, you know, in some ways, like I've, I've talked about this before too. Um, this isn't a book about Bigfoot. It's about all those other things <laughs> filtered through Bigfoot. And once you start thinking of Bigfoot or you know large hairy hominids as you know being kith and kin with that sort of thing um it starts to make a a little bit more sense to me as as a a folkloric lens with you know without which without you know without having any cultural context it doesn't quite make as much sense because a lot of these phenomena really are culture dependent and depending on where you grow up and what the prevalent beliefs are at the time you might view the exact same suite of activity as coming from a fairy, a poltergeist, a witch, a ghost, and everything from sleep paralysis to thrown stones to something running along the top of your of your you know your house. Um, something that I never thought to find any resonance uh, with between you know 
folklore and Bigfoot was the similarities of Bigfoot with with witch lore, especially like the tradition of hairy witches and the number of people that have compared Bigfoot to witches. The amount of activity that Bigfoot has that you can compare to witches as well um, is just absolutely nuts. Um, and then you know, sort of spin you know snowballing out from that. Um, I'm kind of sympathetic to the idea that these are, you know, a lot of these things that we're seeing, especially if you lump in something like Sasquatch with like Sheep Squatch or, or Goat Man or Ghost Squatch or Dog Man, that these sort of therianthropic entities, these half man, half half beast entities might be some sort of manifestation of, you know, goetic phenomena, like literally like some things you would find in the Goetia if you're op- cracking up a book on how to summon spirits and ritual magic. Like, there are kind of precedents for all these different weird half-man, half-beast things. And, uh, you know, because that's always been the trouble. I think we've talked about this before with things like Dog Man and Goat Man or Sheep Squatch or Bat Squatch is that there's just zero, uh, zero archaeological, rather uh, paleontological, anthropological <laughs> Um, evidence for the existence of these things in the fossil record. There's plenty for Bigfoot, but if you're going to say, well, Bigfoot and Sheep Squatch and Bat Squatch, it's like, well, I don't, you know, I have a hard time following you down that flesh and blood route with that. But once you open up the idea to the possibility that these might be, you know, these might have stronger roots in something like fairy lore or the Goetia, it's it starts to open things up a little bit, at least in my eyes. Can I can I answer with an outside perspective, Josh? Please do. That, Please do. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and you can you can disagree with me, but I I'm going to say like probably at the onset of this, Josh would have said more confidently, I think there is an undiscovered creature, but I also think there's this weird thing, and then I think I've kind of well we kind of pushed each other I, I think as we went through this, and at the end of the book I think. Josh is leaning a lot more heavily to yeah this is a really weird yeah, thing that's fair. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fair. Um, just, just the consistency that you see throughout. Yeah, just the consistency. Still, still leaving the, and, and I think we both still leave like some portion. Like, okay, maybe there's something out there that uh, that is a natural creature. Mine is like a probably smaller percentage than Josh's. I think at this point, which is ironically, I think I started with a bigger percentage. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and. Yep. Uh, but uh, I, you know, I think we both allow for that. But I think it's it's gotten a lot smaller for both of us. That's for sure. And and I would say like a, a big part of this book is just giving anybody who's certain a little shot in the arm and saying, "How certain are you, really?" <laughs> like right. I think just yeah. interjecting that little bit of doubt or questioning or you know that again that motivation that desire to keep on right. searching for the answer even after you've come to a conclusion that satisfies you is I think yeah exciting. All right, guys, I'm going to get you to hold on right there. We're going to go to break at the top of the hour. One hour down, two hours to go here on Spaced Out Radio tonight. For the next 90 minutes, we have tonight's guests, Joshua Cutchin, Timothy Renner. Great book on Amazon. You can pick it up right now. Where the Footprints End, High Strangeness, and the Bigfoot Phenomena, Volume 1, Folklore. Coming up right after this on the Mighty SOR. It's Monster Night tonight. Let's get into Sasquatch. Space Travelers, it's me again, Carl. Don't forget to join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month and follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Our Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. Our Facebook page is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Come woo it up with Spaced Out Radio today. Bye! We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache, so why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today.
For the price of one cup of coffee a month, you can become an SOR Space Traveler. The Space Travelers Club is a place where you can interact with other listeners, either live during the show or on our great forum. We want your stories, pictures, comments, and ideas. You'll get live video streams, exclusive content, and be a part of our newsletter. Stay in touch with everything SOR. The Space Travelers Club is just 5 bucks a month at spacedoutradio.com. The party is always on at the Moose Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is where you want to be when visiting Canada's west coast. Open until 2 a.m. nightly, the Moose cranks up the rock while serving some of the best rated food in the city. The menu starts at $6.95. Why party anywhere else in Vancouver when the Moose is right there? Get your horns up and rock with the Moose, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Hey, space travelers, this is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. We are scouring the world for the most intriguing stories of your day. Take the time to read up on the SOR Newswire, where our team, led by Captain Shirk, will deliver to you some of the best paranormal and supernatural news, along with some stories that will blow your mind from the weird to the wacky. It's the news outside the news that piques interest, and that's what we're looking to deliver to you. The SOR Newswire, only at spacedoutradio.com. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from Talk Stream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. I'm feeling a little spicy tonight. What to do? What to do? Why not get Bumblefoot? Four million Scoville units of pure hard rock. Bumblefoot hot sauces come in three flavors. The burning bumble. Tone it down a bit with Bumblelicious and throw the sauce on everything. Spice it up. Bumble me, baby. Bumblefoot hot sauce. Get it today at kajans.com. Get your horns up with me on Spaced Out Radio. This is Ron Bumblefoot Thaw. Come tune in to SOR where you can hear me rock out with Little Brother is Watching, the official theme song of Spaced Out Radio. And then come on over to Bumblefoot.com where you can find out about my tour schedule, my music, and everything else. Bumblefoot.com keeps you up to date on what I'm doing and the best way to stay in touch with my music and music camps. Sign up for my newsletter at Bumblefoot.com and remember, Little Brother is Watching. Hi there, this is the paranormal lawyer, Michael W. Hall. I'd like to invite you to listen in each Sunday night where we're going to open up your eyes to everything strange and paranormal. I will be hosting some great guests with topics that affect us all, such as UFOs, ghosts, and everything paranormal. Let's learn together on Spaced Out Radio Sunday with myself, Michael W. Hall, the paranormal lawyer at spacedoutradio.com. Hey everyone, I'm John Edwards. And I'm Stacy Edwards. Together we're taking over Saturday nights on Spaced Out Radio where we're going to bring our own experiences of the paranormal and talk to the best people we can find to help bring you answers to your strange tales. We're here to entertain your need for weekend woo! So tune us in at spacedoutradio.com starting at 9.06 Pacific, 12.06 AM Eastern where we can all get a little spooky together. Spaced Out Saturday nights right here at spacedoutradio.com. Are you an experiencer of something strange that can't be explained? Do you want help finding out what's going on? I'm Ryan Stacy, head of the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESSA. We've teamed up with Spaced Out Radio to investigate cases filled out in the SOR Sightlines Report. We are independent and there's no cost to what we do. All we need is your experience. Let's find out what's happening together on the SOR Sightlines Report.
The SOR Vault is open for business, and do we have some cool swag for you to pick up? All you have to do is head over to our website and click on the SOR Vault. You have a variety of cool logos to choose from, and put them on anything you want. T-shirts, hoodies, hats, coffee mugs, you name it, we can get it to you. So do your shopping by supporting the store you love. Get your Spaced Out Radio swag at the SOR Vault today. Hi, this is Amber Beckrude, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we store all of the SOR show archives for free. And as an added bonus, every two weeks, I'm posting brand new content on Cryptid Tales, where I will get into some of the spookier legends and folklore from around the world and tell the stories that go with them. Find us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio and check out Cryptid Tales today. Drop a comment and let me know what you want to hear. See you there. Looking for creative ways to get your company out in the public? How about advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Our sales department is waiting to hear from you, and we can work around any budget. From commercial spots to banners to special promotions, there are many opportunities to get your name and product out to our SOR listeners. For a price guide and more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Hour number two of Spaced Out Radio is underway tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. I appreciate each and every one of you tuning us in, especially if you're listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and on the digital side on TalkStream Live and Revolution Radio. Remember, you can check out all of our archives for free at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. The only thing I ask for in return is hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Us Ferris. Oh, I butchered that. Osphersis. Or, no, that's wrong, too. Osphresis. There we go. Osphresis. Three, third time's a charm there, Clam. As a Clam sets a password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio for the show and my personal handle at Dave Scott SOR. We're talking Bigfoot tonight, and we got two of the best researchers right here who have a brand new book, Where Footprints, Where the Footprints End, High Strangeness and the Bigfoot Phenomena, Volume 1, Folklore. Co-authors Joshua Cutchin and Timothy Renner are here. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's a pleasure. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Folklore, when it comes to this creature, there's plenty of it. From people's stories to mountain men to First Nations, American Indians, there's a lot of stories and eyewitness testimony that has gone on for literally centuries, not only in North America, but around the world when it comes to these big, hairy, wild men type creatures. Tim, let's start with you on this one. Let's get into the folklore. What have you learned? What are some of those precious stories? The thing that the, the little resonances for me um, of just these strange little details, like one of the things that we found, and I, I didn't know this before we started the book. I don't know if Josh did or not, but uh, just the you, you hear so many Bigfoot witnesses, for instance, talk about the creatures climbing up on the roof, especially repeat witnesses. If they have the creatures mm-hmm. around their house, mm-hmm. they will say they climb up on the roof and they, they walk on their roof. We found so many of these folkloric creatures that mention, for whatever reason, that they climb on people's roofs or they d- lean on people's roofs or they walk on people's roofs uh, from all over, uh, especially European folklore, but but uh, other other places as well. So it was little resonances like that, which is like that is an odd detail. Like, what does that mean? And uh, you know, of course, a lot of poltergeist. Uh, uh, encounters people will talk about hearing you know footsteps uh, above them on their ceilings or, or in their roof and so forth so it's another resonance with with poltergeist stuff so for me it was it was the little things like that where you just go wow that is a weird little detail to for to appear all over the world in association with these with these creatures 
you know, and what can it mean? I mean, maybe there's symbolism in it. I've often thought that that uh, there, there could be just some kind of symbolism playing out. We walk on the floor, you know, them, them telling us, you know, in symbol, like you walk on the floor, we walk on the roof. I don't know. It might be something more than that. But uh, I mean, the list of creatures that that walk on roofs from these different wild men um, to uh, Draugr, these these kind of Norse undead, which uh, grow bigger and stronger, uh, you know, so it's not a direct equivalent to Bigfoot, but it is a sort of wild man. Uh, they were known to climb on roofs to these various creatures, you know, these wild women in the German forest would lean on, you know, they said they would lean on the roofs. They were so tall, they would lean on the roofs of people's houses and so forth. So, uh, you know, and that's just one example. But for me, that was, you know, just this really powerful resonance. Like, okay, these are something, whatever these are, whatever these wild things are, all over the world, they're noting that they're they're climbing on people's roofs. And uh, we still have that. So that uh, was, you know, like I said, just one of these many, many little things we found. You know, in talking about folklore, I always like to point out that a lot of people use folklore dismissively. And I've heard, you know, some of the flesh and blood hypothesis folks use it very dismissively as in, you know, oh, that's just folklore. And they, they say folklore as if it leaves a bad taste in their mouth when they say it. But as a folk musician, I can tell you that there's a lot of good information passed down in folklore uh for instance you know this plant will heal you, heal you and that plant's going to kill you uh the, that's the most simple thing but in traditional folk song we have a, a saying that uh, a good song or rather a bad song doesn't get to become traditional and uh, there's a lot of information passed down through folklore and i believe these these stories these folkloric stories are our ancestors and they're telling us the way they dealt with this this phenomenon, th- these other these other things, these weird things, these supernatural things, and they're handing it down. And the folklore changes over time, and it gets exaggerated, and you know the stories change a little bit. But the essential truth is there, and I think that's a lot of what we're pulling out when we're doing these comparisons. All right, Josh, do you want to comment? Yeah, I, you know, I think <clears throat> I've said. A couple times in the past throughout all of my research into all these different topics that it's not even the veracity of any single story that ever really grabs me when I look at Fortiana. It's, it's those consistencies that Tim mentions that happen across cultures that both geographically and temporally should have had no cross pollination if, you know, at least if we accept the current, you know, consensus opinion of the history of the world. You know, I'm a big fan of the idea that they were actually global civilizations predating us but that's neither here nor there um you have people you know who are you know a severely undereducated witness from somewhere in the middle of nowhere north dakota who are saying things that have come out of you know greek folklore (laughs) or that you'd find in a dusty old a dusty old tome um talking about you know Baba Yaga in in Russia and the idea that there should be any consistency of someone saying, you know, I had a real experience here that was like this and finding a precedent for that an almost one to one precedent for that in another culture is, is really what has always grabbed me. You know, one of the things that I find fascinating, that's a rabbit hole that I just can't even wrap my head around really is that, uh, you know, there was this longstanding association, um, or long-standing assumption in uh, in folklore and anthropology that r- remains to this day um, that the direct antecedents of the wild man archetype are you know the fauns and satyrs of Greek and, and Roman mythology and uh, the idea of this hairy upright man-like thing in the woods. Many scholars, most scholars who study the topic, say that it's a direct outgrowth of the wild man. The wild man archetype is also influenced by the you know, the Wadwos, who was also influenced by, um, you know, sorry, there's a dog walking around, <laughs> um, who was also influenced, um, you know, the, the Wadwos, the, the part of the reason for that etymology comes from the Greek god Odin, and Odin is also a basis for that wild man that a lot of people talk about every year, Santa Claus. Santa Claus is also viewed by scholars as an outgrowth of the wild man category or the wild man archetype. 
and obviously there are Odinic parallels between Santa Claus and uh, you know and, and, and Odin. You know he has an eight, he, he has eight tiny reindeer. Odin rode slipe near the eight legged horse. Santa Claus runs along rooftops, which is something that Tim was just talking about. You know, Santa Claus takes offerings just like a wild man. He hangs out with elves and, uh, you know, he hangs out with elves who put presents around your tree. Another gifting motif. Um, so, so there are plenty of like little avenues to, that you can go down that resonate. Um, and, uh, it's just it's I, I did like you know a sort of a conspiracy board that I've, I that we're sort of playing with the the idea maybe of putting some incarnation of into into volume two, uh, but basically like you know connecting the Green Man and Odin and the Wadwos and these fawns and satyrs which also tie into Sheep Squatch which also tie into Krampus which ties into Santa Claus just like Odin ties into Santa Claus it really is this web and once you start viewing it that way. And seeing some of this shared behavior between Bigfoot and these other, you know, this cast of characters, it's like, oh, huh, maybe this, you know, maybe this is functioning on that archetypal level. Um, and, you know, the, the weirder the story is, the better. I'm sure some people will say that uh, that we've cherry picked, but, you know, obviously we're writing a book about Bigfoot and high strangeness. You're going to you're going to sort of focus on a lot of this indigenous lore that talks about Bigfoot being able to do strange things. Have either of you ever heard Sasquatch talk? Much like what we hear on the Sierra Sounds. So in real life, like in the field, have either of us heard that? I have not. I have not, Tim. I've recorded it or something like it. That's true. But I I did not hear it at the time. I was interviewing a, a Bigfoot witness at the near the site uh, where he had his, his sighting. And I recorded something. You can hear it under the whole interview. It sounds like uh, kind of like Tuvan throat singing or something very low, very, you know, lower than that even. And uh, just constantly, uh, you know, I caught and, a, cu- and, a couple of seconds of it clean. But uh, this, this, um, this, this Tuvan throat singing idea, too. Um, I mean, obviously, the samurai chatter from the Sierra sounds is, is a little bit better known but um there's sort of that sort of multiphonic quality to a lot to some of those moments in that sound in that recording and you know for one of the chapters in volume two um i have found there there is a there is a there's a precedent for bigfoot and music and bigfoot and singing sometimes described as bigfoot making a sound like a didgeridoo which again is that same quality that you think of tuvan throat singing with multiphonics um you know Mm-hmm. stacked upon each other um and also you know a, a, a uh a very interesting excerpt that also made its way into volume one of uh of ron moorhead and al barry um hearing what barry described as something that he'd heard of in a monastery a long time ago well tuvan throat singing was actually practiced in um, Ainu monasteries, if memory serves, I believe that's the indigenous culture, um, just prior to World War II. Some of those facts might not be right. They're in the book and they're correct, but <laughs> off the top of my head. Um, so, yeah, you, you hear this like this idea of this unearthly music. And, uh, you know, obviously singing is an outgrowth of that, but also just sometimes straight up music. I can think of four or five cases um, where Bigfoot is accompanied by some sort of, you know, operatic singing or a high-pitched whistle or bells and chimes or just this music that's described in a way that you'd find in a lot of fairy folklore you know there's this one story from i believe the late uh 19th century of this boy in oregon who's taken by this 15 foot tall hairy wild man who takes him to this domed underground structure that has you know an indirect lighting source and this unearthly music and he meets another girl who's a who's a uh who's a captive there. And, you know, obviously if you were, would, would replace the 15 foot tall wild man with a, you know, three foot tall, uh, little man clad in green or something and put it in Ireland and not Oregon. That's basically a, a straight up fairy story, like a one to one comparison. But again, unearthly music, it's one of those things that you find in a lot of fairy stories and it's actually pretty severely underreported in some of these Bigfoot stories as well. And while we're speaking comparatively, Josh, I, I think it's really interesting that uh, you point out the speech heard in poltergeist accounts sometimes. Yeah, there's there's a quote from Colin Wilson, the late great Colin Wilson, about how you know eventually noises or voices in poltergeist cases might um, 
come around to, to saying actual words and sounding like, you know, normal human speaking. But when they start off, they're often very guttural and unintelligible and, you know, growly. And when you compare that with things like showers of stones, again, rapping and knocks, um, and even, you know, in, in cases where poltergeists are manifested in seances, large hairy hominids being seen during seances, it kind of casts a lot of these Class B reports that you find in, you know, on, on a website like the BFR website. It kind of casts those in a different light. You know, well, I didn't see a Bigfoot, but I had rocks thrown at me and I heard strange voices in the woods and there was a bad smell. And, well, you know, all that stuff, if you put it inside a house, would be a poltergeist. So who knows that we're not seeing, in some cases at least... Um, poltergeist phenomena manifesting outdoors or Bigfoot manifesting poltergeist or some sort of suggestion that there might be a connection between this large hairy wild man archetype and, and this poltergeist phenomena, this poltergeist activity. One example that I like to cite very often is in the Minerva, Ohio, Minerva monster flap uh, of the 70s or 80s. Man, I'm, I'm great with, with, uh, <laughs> with dates tonight. Sorry about that. Um, but uh, you know, some of the boys would throw stones up along the ridge line where they'd often see this, you know, silhouette of this big sh- shaggy creature. And, the, you know, the stones would be thrown back. Sometimes they'd mark them with an X, but the stones would be thrown back and they'd be warm to the touch. And, of course, the, you know, the flesh and blood hypothesis advocate will say, well, that's because Bigfoot was holding, you know, the, the hairy hominid was holding a rock in its hands. Um, but, which, you know, may, may very well be possible, but you can't deny the fact that. So many of these apports, in fact, maybe perhaps even all of these apports, these manifestations, these, you know, magical uh, appearances of different objects, commonly rocks and pebbles, in poltergeist cases are described as being hot or warm to the touch. So another little suggestion there that maybe we're, you know, maybe we should sort of reevaluate the way that we traditionally look at these phenomena. Timothy Renner and Joshua Cutchin are here tonight talking Bigfoot on Space Down Radio. You know, the reason why I bring up the whole talking aspect is before the show, I was telling you guys how we kind of got scared out of an area around here. Mm-hmm. And my buddy Mike Morin, otherwise known as Merle around these parts, him and I actually heard that voice with our own ears, that that grumbling, that oh, type sound. Yep. And we heard it twice, and, and that is that is super cons- that is consistently described, especially in North America. Uh, super consistently described as vaguely, you know, Eurasian. Um, yeah, it's nuts. Yeah, and you know, unfortunately, during that entire incident when that happened, we literally. I hadn't heard that part of the Sierra sounds. And so when I went and replayed the Sierra sounds, all of a sudden every goosebump on my body stood up because I was like, you know, this is exactly what we heard. Very, very eerily similar. And, you know, for people who have that type of close encounter, when it comes to this, obviously we can't see the creature, but the creature obviously knows we are there how close do we actually think that creature would be from us? Because here we were standing in a meadow. The closest set of trees was where our armed guard mark was, about 30 yards to our left. The trees in front of us were probably 60 to 70 yards away. How close would that be, man? Well, you know, that's, I mean, you hear commonly people talking about how loud these things are. and But at the same time... I have I have nothing I have no evidence to back this up, but I am pretty sure that if you really dug, you would find stories of, you know, groups of five people where three of them heard this samurai chatter loud and clear, and two of them heard absolutely nothing whatsoever. And you know that begs the question of how much, what sort of a role we play in this. I mean, you see the same thing with UFO sightings all the time, where people, three mm-hmm. people will see something very unambiguous, and and two people won't. Um, so, you know, whether that's a matter of perception or not, but it does raise the question if there's some sort of literal, like physical decoupling of there being an actual physical sound in the forest, or if somehow that's being, again, almost sort of mind spoken. I think Tim, didn't you have a a witness who they saw, they both saw a Bigfoot, but they were completely different colors, (laughs) like the same Bigfoot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he was on strange familiars recently. Um, he saw him as a, 
as a kid, like I think they were like twelve or something. He and his friend saw them, and years later he, he uh, reconnected with his friend. And now he he said he saw a, a big white creature jump down out of a tree, and uh, kind of his impression was they just didn't want him to go any further in the woods. It just kind of stopped and like like the woods aren't for you today, and uh, they turned around and ran. And, uh, you know, years later, as an adult, he tracked down his friend because he, he got into Bigfoot and, you know, wanted to talk about this experience. And his friend saw something completely different. His friend saw a black creature that he said was pure evil. So here's, you know, two people that they can agree they saw a Sasquatch. But, you know, the, the feeling they got from it and the actual appearance of the creature to each of these witnesses was completely different. Now, is is that the fallibility of memory or is that something you know generally speaking to the nature of these phenomena themselves and the way that perhaps they're pulling on our expectations i don't i don't know you know well that's a big one we don't know you know it's almost like it's a tease but do you believe though that these creatures as many researchers have said actually travel in threes i mean <laughs> I, I, I mean I, if i may interject really quickly i, I yeah, feel like yeah, i'm dominating I know the company <laughs> I feel, I feel like I'm dominating the conversation, but... Um, no, no, I know where you're going with this. Go ahead. Well, <laughs> I mean, there there seems to be something important about that. I mean, I, I'm not a big, like, numerology guy in terms of, like, oh, it's the number nine, and the number nine appeared in this, and, you know, people sort of dissecting how much dates, you know, add up to, to, be, to be certain numbers. But I will say that there is, you know, at least from what I can perceive... Um, a pretty strong tendency of entities to appear in threes. I mean, again, not a hard and fast rule, but you think about, you know, the very first people, uh, the, the very first person rather to see, you know, the modern incarnation of the men in black, Al Bender, you know, it was him and the three, you know, the three men in black. Um, you know, lots of times you'll hear about, you know, raps coming in some sort of derivative of three or, you know, very commonly, you know, if someone gets three scratches on their back, well, that was a demon. You know, it must be that. And what does that mean? You know, three thirty in the morning is when these things happen because some people who are really into the demonological interpretation will say that it's an inversion of you know Christ's traditional time, dying at three or three thirty in the afternoon. I don't know, um, but I think that there's something to that on one of those archetypal level, by the way, please don't take a shot every time we say archetypal because you'll be dead by the end of, by the end of the program. But, um, yeah, I don't know. As, as I think that there's some, I think that there's something to be said for the fact that these entities appear seldomly alone. I think that there might be something to that because if they're, if they are flesh and blood animals, that might explain how people can hear, you know, a distracting noise or their voice being thrown, and then turn their head, then turn around, and you know the Bigfoot's gone. Although right. that is something that, you know that is something that, that a lot of First Nations tribes say as well, is that they can throw their voices. Right. So that so answer your question about that too. All right. Well, you guys, hold on. We're going to go to break at the bottom of the hour. We're doing a great show tonight on Bigfoot all night long here on Spaced Out Radio. We have Timothy Renner, Joshua Cutchin. They got a brand new book. It can be found on Amazon. Where the Footprints End, High Strangeness, and the Bigfoot Phenomena, Volume 1, Folklore. Oh, this is going to be a great series already. Make sure you check it on out. More with these two great authors coming up on the Mighty SOR. If you like it hot, real hot, then heat up your meals with Bumblefoot Hot Sauce. Get your Bumblefoot Hot Sauce today. The sauce, Bumblelicious, and the 4 million Scoville unit, Bumble f- We're going in hot, real hot, coming out even hotter. Keep the milk nearby. And tantalize your taste buds tonight. Bumblefoot Hot Sauce, available now at kajons.com. From the heartlands of Canada to beards around the world, we know how to take care of you. Fill your follicles with the Mighty Moose Beard Oil. All our oils and balms are handmade and 100% natural ingredients because we care about your beard. And hey, use the promo code SOR2019 and get your Mighty Moose Beard Oil today. You can check us out on our website, MightyMooseBeard.com. Hey. 
Hey, everybody. The SOR Space Travelers is open. For just 5 bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members-only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great forum for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com. Are you looking for great advertising value for your company? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. We have a multitude of places to get your name out there, including commercial ads during the show, special promotions, and banners on our website. Our audience is proven to support the companies that support our show. We can make your budget work for you. So for more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. We're taking Sunday nights out of this world on Spaced Out Radio. This is Michael W. Hall, also known as the Paranormal Lawyer. Together, we're going to go on an exciting journey into the unknown. I'm going to bring you some of the best interviews in the paranormal and supernatural to start your new week off on a freaky note. So tune in to Spaced Out Sundays with me, Michael W. Hall, only on SpacedOutRadio.com. At SpacedOutRadio.com, we are keeping you up to date on all the news with the SOR Newswire. Captain Shirk leads the team that is bringing you the news of the day and exclusive stories on everything paranormal and supernatural. It's free to read, it's updated daily, and it's right there for you. The SOR Newswire is a one-stop shop for the news of the day. Check it out at SpacedOutRadio.com today. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. You wanted new SOR gear, and now you can have it. The SOR Vault is fully stocked with t-shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and everything in between with great logos for you to choose from. So head on over to spacedoutradio.com, click on the SOR Vault, and go shopping. Pricing is quite affordable, and you can look good representing your favorite show. So go to our website and pick up your new SOR wear at the SOR Vault today. Hello, Space Travelers. It's me again, Carl. Don't forget to join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month. And follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Our Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. Our Facebook page is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our archives are free at YouTube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Come woo it up with Spaced Out Radio today. Bye! Cold drinks, great food, and the best music in Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is the place to be, open until 2 a.m. nightly. Everything on the menu starts at just $6.95. Who serves food that cheap anymore? At the Moose, you'll never know who you'll run into. Rock stars, actors, athletes, it's the place everyone wants to be. So join us at the Moose Vancouver, the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Need that weekend supernatural fix? Look no further than Spaced Out Saturday right here at spacedoutradio.com. I'm Stacy Edwards. And I'm John Edwards. Each Saturday night, Stacy and I are going to bring you the best in paranormal, cryptids, UFOs, you name it, and we're going there. It's all about the experience and to share the knowledge with all of you. So tune us in every Saturday night on Spaced Out Saturdays starting at 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, only at spacedoutradio.com. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. 
Hey, space travelers, this is John Rezig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you'd know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. Welcome back to Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us tonight. We want to remind you that if you've missed portions of this show or others, you can check out our free archives at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio for the show and my personal handle at Dave Scott SOR. Tonight we are talking Bigfoot. Timothy Renner and Joshua Cutchin, if you go to Amazon, have a great book out where the footprints end, High Strangeness and the Bigfoot Phenomena, Volume 1, Folklore. Gentlemen, welcome back to the show. Great to be back. Yep, good to be here. Tim, I want to ask you, you've been doing this for decades. Why write another book about Bigfoot? (laughs) <laughs> like how, and, and I mean that with all due respect, okay? All due respect, because for so many people, the information always seems the same. How do we mm-hmm. find more new information to keep this understanding going that there is way more to this creature than we know and that we've ever scratched the surface on? Well, this is the book that. I wish had been available to me when when I started uh, getting into Bigfoot. I'll say that. I think it probably should have been written 20 years ago. And that's not to pat me and Josh on the back. I'm just saying that uh, this look at Bigfoot through this lens probably should have been done before. Um, there were hints of it before. There were hints of people looking at the strangeness. Al Berry's book from, I think it was 73, it was just called Bigfoot. Uh, he certainly didn't shy away from it. Uh, again, Stan Gordon, great researcher. He's never shied away from the weirdness. But this look at it through the lens of folklore and this gathering together, these reports of strangeness um, from all over as regards the Bigfoot phenomena, it's, uh, you know, it's something that uh, I think has been missing and, uh, I'm just glad I had Josh on board with me to, for the journey. Um, I thought this was going to be my mic drop for Bigfoot, and I I, I fell in love with the, the topic again. Not that I fell out in love with it, but I just thought, well, this is going to be, you know, everything I have to say, at least for a while. But uh, as I've been, you know, reading and rereading the, the books as we're going through the different proof stages and stuff, I said, boy, I love this. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not done with this yet. So uh, I will write more. But uh, I think that uh, for me, this book, you know, it needed to be written. And uh, there's been a lot of what Josh and I call weird washing over the years of uh, the strange parts of the stories have been have been edited out, have been taken out. And you're left with uh, these stories that make it sound, you know, most like an ape in the woods. And uh, as we've done our research, we found, you know, several stories um, that uh, it just isn't the case. I mean, there's a lot of weirdness. Uh, the Ape Canyon story, I don't know if, you know how familiar people are with that, but uh, that's probably the best example of a story that's reported in Bigfoot literature again and again and again. Um, I think any kind of Bigfoot book that's just a, like a survey of the topic mentions this Ape Canyon incident. Uh, people may be familiar with it where some miners uh, shot at a creature, and then later that night a bunch of creatures came back and attacked their cabin. 
That's the very, very shorthand version. And that's the version I knew. And I was into Bigfoot. That's all I knew. I was big time into Bigfoot. And that's the only version of that story I knew. And uh, here, during the course of this book, Josh said, you know, you, you need to look at, at Fred Beck, who was one of the miners. You need to look at his account. And uh, sure enough, he talks about a lot of weird stuff that gets edited out of those stories when people report that Ape Canyon. It's, you know, spirits and following white arrows to the sky and uh, unknown sounds coming from within the ground and a ports and uh, finding two footprints in the middle of the acre wide sandbar along the river with no, no other footprints around it. Uh, you know, strange thing after strange thing that uh, Fred Beck reports and it was just all edited out of the story. So, uh, you know, the weirdness is there and, uh, you can't always account for it, but uh, you can report it. We look at Ape Canyon not as much as we look at Bluff Creek, where the famous video was filmed in 1967. Mm-hmm. And and when we look at this, Josh, and we try and compare the evidence from yesteryear to the way it is today, how do we trust today's evidence if we barely trust the evidence from the past? Well, and especially, I mean, like how how uh, how easy it is to fake things and, and the, the level of hoaxing that we have. I mean, I so I you know I've gone on the record as saying that I I think that we tend to overestimate people who are are lying when they talk about this sort of thing i think it obviously happens but i think a lot of it is you know when they see these things there's a significant portion that is just misidentification or people being mistaken or something along those lines and obviously i also think that there are people who are absolutely telling the truth and also perceived 100 percent accurately what they were seeing uh certainly no doubt um but uh yeah it's, it's one of those things where like i i don't even know I mean, you know, every every generation comes with its own motivations for, you know, for 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 actually being an outright liar or a hoaxer. I mean, you know, you can't read a lot of the stories from, you know, pre nineteen thirty without going, oh well, maybe this was just you know yellow journalism used to sensationalize and sell papers. Um, and you know, at the same time, you also look at stuff today and there's all this motivation to become, you know, a celebutoid, you know, someone who was uh, just famous for being famous by putting out a YouTube video or something. I think there really is, you know, not necessarily a monetary motivation. There hasn't been a lot of monetary motivations in, in, in the supernatural uh, for some time, but today there, you know, likes are the new form of cultural currency. So I guess it's the reason some people put it out there. And it's the reason why I'm like, I'll be honest with you, man. I have, I haven't listened. I haven't really looked at a, seriously looked at a ufo or, or a bigfoot video you know in a long time and you know because there's just they're always so ambiguous and i think that might be that might be part of the pl- part of the, the point you know so one of the things that i do talk a little bit about or we, we we talk a little bit about in volume two is applying you know this george p hansen trickster and the paranormal kind of model uh, to the Bigfoot phenomena, because in that great book, which is a great, super <laughs> one of the best books I've ever written, also one of the oh, sorry I've ever read, also one of the hardest books <laughs> I've ever read. Um, but uh, he talks about you know how there is this self-negating aspect of these phenomena when talking about UFOs and when talking about ghosts and talking about psi phenomena, and he sort of mentions this self-negating aspect regarding Bigfoot, but he doesn't really. You know, George Hansen in that book does never really go into it. And I I think there's plenty of evidence to suggest that, yeah, I mean, there are people who something about the phenomena really seeks to obscure itself. You know, it's that old I think it's an old Mitch Hedberg joke about like, what if Bigfoot is just blurry? But that kind of is is where I am right now is there's some sort of deliberate uh, obfuscation on the behalf of the phenomena to to keep itself ambiguous um, throughout all these years. And as our means of capturing what we perceive as an objective version of reality, by which I mean, you know, just photographic evidence and audio recordings and stuff, I think the phenomena has had to become more ambiguous um, and more, you know, self-defeating or self, uh, self-negating over the years. At the same time, you know, there are plenty of people who had 
uh, in, in all these phenomena, UFOs and all the way through Bigfoot, there are plenty of people that I believe had genuine experiences and then started faking it or, you know, vice versa was fit were, were faking evidence and somehow attracted the phenomena to themselves. And you'll find this, you know, having a precedent in a lot of parasol ecological research and a lot of UFO research, but, you know, specifically thinking of things like the Philip experiment where there was, uh, you know, where there's a group of people holding a seance and they came up with this completely fictional child with a completely fictional backstory. And yet they somehow were able to call in actual, um, you know, parapsychological effects, wraps and table tipping and stuff like that. that and things that identified itself in conjunction with this Philip story, even though the, the story of this Philip entity was completely you know, fabricated. So I think there is an aspect of this we've got to take very seriously about, you know, people who start out hoaxing stuff and then start having, you know, these things happen. I'm specifically thinking of, uh, you know, Paul Freeman who had the, who has the Freeman footage. I think it's pretty well accepted that Freeman, uh, hoaxed a bunch of tracks, but at the same time, he also has some of the best Bigfoot footage that we have outside of the Patterson Gimlin film. So I think it's worthy of consideration. Uh, yeah. but again, you know, t- take everything with a grain of salt, I guess. But that's kind of my question. And Tim, I'll bring you in on this. Okay. With people getting better at Photoshop editing, uh, CGI. It's hard to take anything video or photograph wise seriously these days. And, you know, the way people zoom in to make everything blurry, it mm. doesn't do or bode well for the research, in my opinion. I find it extremely frustrating, much like mm-hmm. the majority of our audience when it comes to that. So this means that puts an extra emphasis on the story on the eyewitness account. So how do we take that evidence? If we have all this technology that we can't trust, how do we take all this evidence and build a story or a research area out of it? Well, hard science tends to dislike witness testimony, but um, as a folklorist, I can look at these things and see a consistency across time. Uh, that's one of the things that convinced me when I was doing my historical Bigfoot books, uh, finding these stories from, uh, you know, the 1800s and early 1900s. That's one of the things that convinced me that, uh, no, they weren't just looking at mountain men when they were calling these things wild men because of the consistency of the behaviors they were reporting, uh, various things like, you know, not just physical attributes, big and hairy, or glowing eyes or something like that. But uh, the way they reacted towards dogs, for instance, the, this sort of animosity towards dogs or uh, being shot and not reacting, this, this idea of bulletproofness or uh, following people home uh, after being shot or, or after an aggressive encounter and uh, even climbing on roofs and slapping walls and things like that. And these are things that modern witnesses are reporting and, I've reproduced these, you know, these articles and some people before me uh, had done some historical Bigfoot books, but I have the advantage of having searchable archives. They didn't. So very few of these articles appeared before my books. And it's it's not that I'm a more talented researcher than the guys who did before me. It's simply I have better tools. I have search tools where I can find a lot more of these stories. And I'm convinced a lot of these stories that appeared in my books, no one's read them since they were in the paper in, you know, 1880 or whenever it was. So it's not like modern witnesses had this wealth of stories to go back and say, okay, this is how these things act. So I'm going to make up my story and I'm going to have it do what this thing did in this article from 1880. It just wasn't happening. So the fact that they're describing this behavior over the course of hundreds of years, to me, says that there is something to witness testimony. Uh, I'm not trying to prove it to science. I'm trying to document people's stories. Um, I don't think mainstream science is going to accept this. Um, You know, again, I might be wrong if somebody uh, rolls a body into a lab. I'm wrong, but uh, I just I just don't think it's going to happen. So witness testimonies is the best we have. Um, My friend Tobe Johnson from uh, Strange Brow, he has a place called the Al Moon Lab where he's had many, many strange things happen. He told me uh, something very, very interesting. Uh, I like the way he phrased it, so I often use it. He says, uh, as regards to the phenomenon, he says, it's almost like we don't have permission to photograph it or to take film. 
but we're we're okay. It's okay with audio for whatever reason. That's why we have great audio, fantastic audio, like the Sierra Sounds and and other people have captured some very really really interesting great audio. But uh, I really like the way he he phrased that. It's, it's almost like we don't have permission to film it. And if you look at other paranormal things like Skinwalker Ranch, for instance, they tried to film what was going on there many many times and came up with uh, you know pretty much nothing or very very ambiguous things. The uh, the cords to the the cameras were even cut at one time. Uh, it's like it's almost like we're just not allowed to film this stuff for whatever reason. We don't know why, but uh, it doesn't like to be filmed. All right, a couple questions from our audience here. Let's get to Joey in our Space Travelers Club, and he is saying, "I feel the Patterson Gimlin film supports the idea that Sasquatch." having a more powerful lower body would have a compliant step glide gait, as well as a lack of head bob associated with such a gait, plus footprints having indication of horizontal walking step differing from humans with upward foot lift. What's your thoughts? Tim, we'll start with you. Uh, this gets into Jeff Meldrum territory with the, uh, the gait of the creature and so forth. Uh, you know, these are some of the most convincing things that, uh, you know, the, the, the footprints are, you know, our most convincing evidence. Um, they happen to be secondary relics. If you think of it like saints relics, primary relics would be like hair, uh, skin samples, blood, uh, things that actually came from the creature. Secondary relics would be things, things uh, they touch. So like in terms of a saint, it would be like the saint's clothing or prayer cloth or, or something like that. Uh, our best evidence amounts to secondary relics for Bigfoot, th these these footprints that show things like dermal ridges and, and mid-tarsal breaks. Um, y you know, it's an interesting theory, uh, the compliant gate theory, but I would also point to the numerous, numerous creatures in folklore which are described as having this gliding motion when they move, this very, very smooth gliding motion, uh, very quick, very smooth. Uh, so... You know, you can look for a compliant gate, but I can point to any number of creatures from folklore that that uh, glide when they walk as well. Yes. So, Josh, people, what's your thoughts? Sure. So, to give people sort of an overview, uh, we've divided roughly um, the book into two different volumes. Volume one being folklore, as we've been talking about, but uh, volume two is a little bit more, just for lack of a better term, we're calling it evidence based. So, it's it really goes more into the actual. You know, and the mystery lights, vocalizations, and mimicry, altered states of consciousness, hex signs, and tracks with you know toes, uh, oddly numbered, uh, odd numbers of toes, or also you know these problems with the trackways, um, especially in terms of things like not only disappearing trackways but also you know finding a single footprint or <laughs> a one-legged trackways, you know trackways that just seem to be all of the left or the right foot. You know, that compliant gate is really interesting, but the thing that people who have been witnesses, and obviously Jeff Meldrum has a lot of experience in this area, and I would defer to him on a lot of this stuff, but, you know, you read some of these explanations, and it just sounds, well, I don't know. It sounds sounds a little bit elaborate for me. Again, if, if anybody's going to, if anybody has gotten the biological nature of Bigfoot right at this point, my money would be on Meldrum, but... Man, you listen to these witnesses, these eyewitnesses, and they always talk about how absolutely unnatural it is. And sometimes they'll go to where, you know, this this creature was walking and it'll be the most uneven terrain. Now, obviously, if it's, you know, if this is an animal that's been, that's evolved over the, you know, centuries, you know, that millennia to, to you know, navigate this rocky, difficult um, terrain, then it makes sense that it would be able to, to, to you know, to navigate that but at the same time it's just always been compared to the super smooth you know um super smooth gliding motion that's akin to something like a you know cross-country skier and it just always seems a little bit funny the other this becomes a little bit more of a problem when you realize that how that's also that could also be viewed as an expression of this uh, this this phenomena of phasing bigfoot you know bigfoot that can walk through brambles without making a sound and or bigfoot that literally are seen walking through fence posts you know <laughs> which is there's no shortage of well, obviously if you just saw a bigfoot that can walk through fence posts a bigfoot that can phase in and out of you know material existence if you see that creature or that entity walking across you know rocky terrain they'd have no problem with it either yeah i think also a, a, one of my favorite bigfoot cases is this um 
is the uh, the Rochdale uh, incident, which featured some apports and some poltergeist phenomena. But oftentimes they would say that they would see this Bigfoot running through heavy vegetation and hear nothing, see none of the vegetation moving, and the same creature uh you know around this home in Rochdale Indiana would would run around and through you know what through mud where they should have left prints and not leave any prints so this idea of the smoothness of the gate when combined with other witness reports of either bigfoot not leaving prints or bigfoot choosing to pass through things at will it kind of sounds like it's all describing the same aspect and the only thing that i can personally the way that I can reconcile those three things, the gliding and the phasing and the lack of the prints, is that there seems to be this ability to choose to be non-corporeal at will. Um, that's the only explanation that explains all three of those sort of anomalies for me personally, while still you know, maintaining some sympathy towards uh, you know, the incredible work that Meldrum has done. I mean, that's really my first book. When people talk about get, wanting to get into Bigfoot, I press you know, uh, – his book, it's what was it Legend Meets Science into people's hands are like, read this first. <laughs> because man, those footprints are the best evidence that we have for, for Bigfoot uh being a, a real entity. So I met a witness uh last Sunday at an area where he he saw a creature. Uh he saw it on May twenty first. And he described it uh first of all it it uh dropped down to a crouching position. And his description of the way it looked, he said it, it was like a transformer. That's what, that was his description of the way it moved. When it was in that position, he said it moved like a spider uh, along the ground. Then it got up and made its way across the field very quickly, incredibly quickly. He said faster than anything he's ever seen. But he's, and at that point, he described it as, he said it looked like it was on a moving sidewalk. It was that smooth. And this was running through a you know a rugged farm field into the woods, uh, broad daylight sighting. So you know here's here's this smooth movement again described just you know by someone I met just last week. Or maybe or or you know again maybe it's that compliant gate, <laughs> you know who knows. But yeah. again, let's inject a little bit of of a question to that assumption. I guess sort of where I found where I sit. Gentlemen, we got to go to break here in about forty five seconds. And one of the things I want to get into, I want I want to turn up the woo card a little bit. All right, let's turn it face up, and let's right. see. I want to get I want to get into some of these these strange stories in our final half hour with you coming up here about you know why we think it's interdimensional, why we think there's something special about this creature. Can it pixelate? Can it jump from dimension to dimension? Does it have cloaking devices? You know, I want to know it all. I know our audience does. And I think you two have the answers with your brand new book, Timothy Renner, Joshua Cutchin, and their brand new book, Where the Footprints and High Strangeness and the Bigfoot Phenomena, Volume 1, Folklore. Oh, Volume 2 is going to be good, too. All right, gentlemen, I'm going to get you to hold on right there because we're going to go to break here on Spaced Out Radio. We are continuing the Bigfoot talk in our number three. And we're also going to get to the SOR Newswire and the Thought of the Dave. Thought of the Dave question today, in case you're curious. If Dogman and Sasquatch stepped into a wrestling ring, who wins? It's an important question tonight on the Thought of the Dave. More Spaced Out Radio in Hour 3 next. Feeling a little spicy tonight. What to do? What to do? Why not get Bumblefoot? Four million Scoville units of pure hard rock. Bumblefoot hot sauces come in three flavors. The burning Bumblef. Tone it down a bit with Bumblelicious and throw the sauce on everything. Spice it up. Bumble me, baby. Bumblefoot hot sauce. Get it today at kajans.com. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. 
You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. Hey everyone, I'm John Edwards. And I'm Stacy Edwards. Together we're taking over Saturday nights on Spaced Out Radio where we're going to bring our own experiences of the paranormal and talk to the best people we can find to help bring you answers to your strange tales. We're here to entertain your need for weekend. Woo! So tune us in at spacedoutradio.com starting at 906 Pacific, 1206 AM Eastern where we can all get a little spooky together. Spaced Out Saturday nights right here at spacedoutradio.com. Hi there, this is the paranormal lawyer, Michael W. Hall. I'd like to invite you to listen in each Sunday night where we're going to open up your eyes to everything strange and paranormal. I will be hosting some great guests with topics that affect us all, such as UFOs, ghosts, and everything paranormal. Let's learn together on Spaced Out Radio Sunday with myself, Michael W. Hall, the paranormal lawyer at spacedoutradio.com. We are scouring the world for the most intriguing stories of your day. Take the time to read up on the SOR Newswire, where our team, led by Captain Shirk, will deliver to you some of the best paranormal and supernatural news, along with some stories that will blow your mind from the weird to the wacky. It's the news outside the news that piques interest, and that's what we're looking to deliver to you. The SOR Newswire, only at spacedoutradio.com. For the price of one cup of coffee a month, you can become an SOR Space Traveler. The Space Travelers Club is a place where you can interact with other listeners, either live during the show or on our great forum. We want your stories, pictures, comments, and ideas. You'll get live video streams, exclusive content, and be a part of our newsletter. Stay in touch with everything SOR. The Space Travelers Club is just 5 bucks a month at spacedoutradio.com. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Hey, space travelers, this is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you'd know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. Hello, space travelers. It's me again, Carl. Don't forget to join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month and follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Our Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. Our Facebook page is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Come woo it up with Spaced Out Radio today. Bye. The SOR Vault is open for business, and do we have some cool swag for you to pick up? All you have to do is head over to our website and click on the SOR Vault. You have a variety of cool logos to choose from, and put them on anything you want. T-shirts, hoodies, hats, coffee mugs, you name it, we can get it to you. So do your shopping by supporting the store you love. Get your Spaced Out Radio swag at the SOR Vault today. Hello, everyone. This is Ryan Stacy from the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESA. We're glad to team up with Spaced Out Radio to help investigate your experiences on the SOR Sightlines Report. Together, we'll investigate the strange sightings and occurrences you've had. We're looking for answers just like you. So fill out a Sightlines Report on the Spaced Out Radio website and let's figure out what's going on together. Looking for creative ways to get your company out in the public? How about advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Our sales department is waiting to hear from you, and we can work around any budget. 
from commercial spots to banners to special promotions, there are many opportunities to get your name and product out to our SOR listeners. For a price guide and more information, please contact us at sales at space.radio.com. We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache, so why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. The party is always on at the Moose Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is where you want to be when visiting Canada's west coast. Open until 2 a.m. nightly, the Moose cranks up the rock while serving some of the best rated food in the city. The menu starts at $6.95. Why party anywhere else in Vancouver when the Moose is right there? Get your horns up and rock with the Moose, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. We're kicking off the third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. Thank you so much for taking the time to tune us on in. We welcome back everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates and on the digital side on Revolution Radio and Talk Stream Live. Remember, you can check out all of our archives for free by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Osphersis. Osphersis is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as the clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website, spacedoutradio.com, has a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio for the show and my personal handle at Dave Scott SOR. For the final time tonight, we introduce Timothy Renner and Joshua Cutchin. They've got a great series coming out. Book one is Where the Footprints End, High Strangeness and the Bigfoot Phenomena, Volume 1, Folklore. And this is what we've been discussing all night long. I love these guys. They're two of the best out there when it comes to solid, balanced research. And I suggest you get their book as well. Gentlemen, welcome back. Great to hey, be that- yeah, and thanks, thanks for you're being so nice. I mean, I don't even. What, what do you want from me? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you know, I just want a picture of the beard autographed. That's it. That's it. Okay, we it's can not much. Do that. We can do that. black and white. We... Black and white. <laughs> Eight by ten. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> that's just the way it goes. No, right. um, guys, I, I the reason why I, I'm actually promoting that a little bit, okay, is we're going to be starting these new series on our YouTube channel very, very soon here. And I'm going to be doing a lot of top fives. And I've been thinking a lot about ideas. And I, I started thinking about who would I choose in my top five of researchers? And you guys came up along with, like I said earlier in the show, David Weatherly, Micah Hanks, and John Tenney. And I just think, hey, I want my audience to get the best, so this is what we're doing. But we're going to move on. Enough about that. Enough of the love in. Let's move on to some woo here. All right. Question from the audience here, right off the bat. This is from Horror Realm on our YouTube chat. Who wins in a fight between the Rake and Dogman? I'm going Dogman, stronger jowls, much, much more physically attuned for brawling, whereas the Rake, well, he's just thin, and I don't think he would get his hat off in time. How about you guys? (laughs) 
Um, I guess I'm with you on that one. I I don't have any uh, proof that uh, dude, you know rakes have ever touched anybody or anything. So, dude, so no, think... you you give the rake a laser pointer and it's game over. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. Uh, Gentlemen, let's get into the woo side of everything, because much like you, I believe that there is something extremely special about Sasquatch. I don't know what that is. I I, I fear of calling it supernatural, but my own experiences have led me down this road as well as others as well. So my question to you guys is this, as we move forward, what convinced you Josh, and we'll start with you, that there is more to this creature than just being a primordial hominid. You know, that's that's funny because I, I started off, man, I have a, a great collection of, of books on relic hominids, and I started off so hesitant towards embracing that idea um, that, it, that there might be something other than just being a large wood ape because i mean it's going to be if we if it's even possible at all it's going to be a lot more difficult to to prove the idea that it's some sort of you know magical wild man but uh you know to me it was once you start look if 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 bigfoot is just a monkey then i have no idea what the heck went on in the 70s in pennsylvania like full stop because there's just so much so many things that are anomalous um and so, so for me, it was that partially. Um, the other thing is just again these these resonances that you see, where it just looks like we're basically reskinning. We're putting a new face on a lot of this similar activity. Um, you know, Bigfoot not is a monkey. If Bigfoot is a monkey, evolutionarily speaking, it has a lot to answer for. Yeah, that's that's another good way to put it too. Um, yeah. I, so I, I mean, like, I, so like again, I, I I was more sympathetic towards the flesh and blood hypothesis before I started this book. I definitely became less, probably still a little bit more than Tim Tim is, ironically enough. But um yeah, it's just it's just all those consistencies and then um oh man, we didn't talk about the woman in white stuff. <laughs> that's that's another that that was another nail in the coffin for me is how you go back through and you find, you know, it's just these these weird consistencies. Um and you know, in the way that you can you can find folkloric patches for a lot of the holes in these current biological theories, I guess that's that's what I'm saying. Uh, that where I guess that's, that's sort of what what pushed me over the edge, Tim. Yeah, uh, I mean, if like I said, evolutionarily speaking, you need to account for uh, glowing eyes, not just reflective eyes. But let's say they are reflecting, and people, even though numerous numerous witnesses insist that they weren't reflecting they were self-illuminating but uh let's say they're all wrong and and i doubt they are i trust the witnesses if you're going to trust them that they see a a giant monkey man in the woods i think you should trust their other observations as well but let's say they were wrong and their eyes were reflecting light and not uh not uh glowing self-illuminating uh there are no high order primates with a tepidum lucidum which is a the reflective layer uh, which which causes that there are no known animals anywhere with glowing eyes. If we're talking about eye glow versus eye shine, um, th- Josh can speak to the idea of uh, people saying Bigfoot has thick skin and that's why it seems to be bulletproof. Uh, he did a lot of work on that. Um, there's a lot of things that uh, just evolutionarily speaking yep. just don't work. For example, what Tim's talking about, um, basically the two explanations are that Bigfoot has really thick skin. For in terms of Bigfoot being bulletproof, either has really thick skin or has a very thick subdermal level of of fat. Well, okay, let's take the thick skin, you know, aspect. Um, in terms of just memology in general, but primates specifically as well, um, the areas. Are of hair are thinnest. Sorry, the areas of skin are thickest when they're covered in hair. You know, think of how easy it is to, to sort of nick your scalp and your, your skin's really thin there, and that that's a that's a trait that's a trend that holds true for, for all primates. So the idea that Bigfoot would have thick skin really goes against a bunch of mammalian precedents. The other idea is that, not unlike grizzly bears, they have a very you know thick layer of subdermal fat, which you know is is realistic, but 
you know, I've seen videos of grizzlies being hit with bear shot, and they at least react. So if you know you have somebody unloading a revolver five times into a into a Bigfoot, or you know, worse yet, shooting them with a high powered rifle, they're if they're if they're a flesh and blood creature, they should react sometimes. But a lot of times, they don't leave blood. They don't even run away. They might walk away, or they won't even like act like they're being you know hit with with uh, with bullets at all. I guess looking back too, I was thinking about this while Tim was talking. Another thing that really surprised me was was the fact that there are you know plenty of stories of people who have missing time in conjunction with Bigfoot uh, sightings. It's not super common, but it happens enough to be sort of to to be sort of a minor trope. Uh, I think one of the more famous examples was I'll never forget uh, on Sasquatch Chronicles the the um, host Wes Germer was talking about when he and his brother had a uh, their their actual initial sighting, they said that it felt like it took about forty minutes while they were you know their car was being paced by these creatures. Mm-hmm. But when the, once they got back down the mountain, it was about four hours later. And they were saying this. There was another researcher on the program who was like, "Well, yeah, time speeds up when you're when you're when you're under stress, and that's literally like the opposite of every scientific <laughs> uh, experiment that's ever been done in terms of the perception of time and stress and how like, time actually." Um, slows down you know (laughs) if anybody's ever been in a car accident can tell you that too everything feels like in slow motion so the the idea that you know you might have in that case three hours and 20 minutes of missing time after running into bigfoot seems to me that it might have a little bit more to do with uh something a little bit high strange along the lines of ufos or fairy folklore than it does you know an undiscovered primate a lot of people have claimed to see this creature in pixelation a lot of people, myself included, mm-hmm. a lot of people who have said they that they see it moving around in the trees, almost like in the movie Predator, where the creature was camouflaged by by almost like a cloaking device. And mm-hmm. I'm curious what you think about this and where your research took you with this, because with those statements that a lot of people claim to have, how real could it be for this creature to be cloaking itself? I mean, you know, I I tend to think of so I, you know again like we sort of talked about earlier. I I tend to to edge more towards the symbolic and you know the fact that there again like a lot of these things we've been talking about, there have been other entities throughout folklore that that seem to have abilities to transform invisible or near invisible at a moment's notice. But there is an interesting sort of subset, uh, again, not a strong motif and not even a strong motif within a strong motif. Like this is kind of a niche thing, but it does recur time and again of, you know, Bigfoot wearing these belts that appear to be almost some sort of technology. They're, you know, belts that have some sort of glowing panel on them or something, or, you know, Bigfoot interacting with, with technology, there's a story from one of Tim's books about this Bigfoot who's carrying around a box, or this wild man is carrying around a box and is headbutting trees. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, I think that I think that there might be something to the fact that there's some sort of technology being employed. Um, I mentioned the one about the box and headbutting trees specifically because you know one of Ron Moorhead's things that he's heard time and again was that these creatures, the wood knock, is actually not them you know, knocking wood against wood or two rocks together or clapping or anything, but it's actually them phasing in and out of literally phasing in and out of, out of trees is what he's heard from some, from some people, which sounds nuts, but at the same time is very resonant with, you know, these Western European and European and, you know, everywhere. Uh, This idea of the genus loci, these spirits of the land. Um, So the idea that (laughs) maybe, this was a misinterpretation, and the Bigfoot who was ramming his head against a tree was <laughs> had had faulty technology with his box. He was just staring at this box and ramming his head against a tree. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Um, the number of wild men that that are said to live in trees, and by wild men, I mean these these folkloric wild men from all over the world, like the the Russian Lishi and and the Apple Tree Man from from the UK and so forth. The number of them that that are said to live inside trees to are you know it's incredible. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know. Um, I th- I think it's really it's really tempting to say, oh, they're shifting into dimensions, or they're being quantum this or quantum that. But a rose by any other name would smell just as sweet, and that to me doesn't seem much more satisfact much much more satisfactory than saying, you know, that 
they're spirit beings. You know, it kind of it kind of means the same thing to me at least. So I have I have trouble dub- doubling down on the dimensional or or uh, you know quantum sort of ideas because I feel like personally for me those are just re reskinned names for th- concepts that we've had for a long time. Fitness girls in our chat room has an interesting question. Tim, we'll start with you on this one. She is asking. Humans only see a small part of the entire spectrum. Does this or could this explain cloaking? Sure. Yeah, it it could. Now, you know, I don't know how we prove that. You know, that's this is um, these are interesting thought experiments. And and this is often how we do make breakthroughs like, you know, thought experiments like this. But uh, until we prove it, it's science fiction, you know, Um, so you know, maybe, maybe, I mean, I, you know, I, I certainly, uh, that's a more appealing theory to me than, uh, some of the flesh and blood guys have posited that their hair is like fiber optic and it, depending on the angle, it will channel light in a different way. And, uh, therefore they will appear invisible or appear to phase, even though they're not. Um, again, this is asserting a, evolutionary advantage to this creature which among the you know the various other evolutionary advantages it has that it might as well be supernatural if it has this many uh you know qualities that that set it apart from other animals where are the bodies tim ah so that that gives that comes up in volume two and it's one of my favorite uh points to talk about Lots of people have claimed to shoot them, to capture them, or to otherwise have a body in some form. Over the years, uh, lots of people have. And 100% of these bodies, without, not 99%, not 80%, not 95%, 100% of these bodies are gone. They do not exist. They are not available. They have been either taken away by, you know, they say the the creatures come back. Some hunters say the creatures come back and reclaim their own. Some people have buried them and have forgotten where the graves were. Some people have said these uh, mysterious uh, government uh, organizations have come and reclaimed the body. It doesn't matter in the end. It doesn't matter because we don't have a body and then we don't have a body. So uh, like physical evidence... Now, we do have some hair samples and stuff, but uh, many, many hair samples go missing. They will, they will disappear in the mail, and people point to this grand government conspiracy. But I'd say there's something else going on. Uh, these DNA samples tend to not get returned and uh, so forth. So these bodies, they disappear 100% of the time. Uh, we're not allowed to have a body for whatever reason. Are we not allowed, or are they just more like the elephant family, where up until recent history, we'd never seen the body of an elephant? Well, you know, I, I, I hear these, um, I know we're coming up <laughs> against the end, there's still so much to talk about, but, you know, I, I know that there are a lot, of, a lot of flesh and blood hypothesis advocates will say things like, you know, well, you know, it's very rare to come across a cougar carcass, and it's very rare to come across a bear carcass. But, you know, at the same time, we have plenty of good photos of those animals, and people have come across the remains of these things in some capacity. And, yeah, I know all the all the explanations of, you know, well, porcupines like to gnaw on bones, and bone, you know, it, decomposition takes place more rapidly than people expect, and, you know, and... There might be that that aspect of these animals that are so anthropomorphic that they that they bury their that they bury their uh, their loved ones or you know their their clan mates or whatever. But you know, in terms of that, in terms of them actually having some new degree of culture that would consider that important is is such an anthropo- anthropomorphization and also c- kind of works backwards even worse than <laughs> than some of the woo stuff for me. But I mean, you know, again. I think I'd like to think that Tim and I, while skeptical of some of these explanations, we're certainly not dogmatic about them, um, and we try to stay as open-minded as we can about a lot of these possibilities. So, yeah, that's that's something that def- definitely gets addressed. Do you think they're taking their bodies into a different dimension, Tim? <laughs> if if they're coming from a different dimension to begin with, then yes. Uh, how's that for a non-committal answer? <laughs> Oh, come on. Come on. <laughs> it, it, I mean, if it's that's an easy place com- to bury them. 
if yeah, if that's where they're coming from to begin with, then then they're probably returning to the source. Yeah. Or they, or you know, or the, or they eat them. I mean, there's plenty of plenty of tribal lore that holds that Bigfoot are you know anthropophages. So if they are, uh, you know, if they do eat human beings, then who knows? Maybe they, you know, conserve <laughs> conserve the bodies of of their you know their kith and kin to to uh to eat you know for further sustenance and also conveniently to do away with the evidence. Who knows? But there would still be bones. But I mean, nature. Yeah. I mean, but let's let's just be honest, though. Nature has a beautiful way of cleaning itself up. Oh no, absolutely. I mean, you it, you can find plenty of time lapse videos, and you know, as as we sort of alluded to, the uh, the 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 amount of time that takes place from you know a, a deer first falling into the in you know down dead to there being like almost zero to close to zero no evidence is always shockingly fast um but i mean yeah it just you you couple that with the weirdness and you couple that with the lack of photos and you couple that with these extremely compelling witness stories and it's like well it seems like something exists but it's just it's not playing by our rules um but you know again maybe not i mean maybe you know, maybe there's a Bigfoot burial ground out there that we've just got to discover one day. Who knows? That's the big question. That's the big question. Who knows? Gentlemen, you got volume one done. When's volume two? Hopefully by Christmas this year. That's that's the goal. And I think I think we're on track for that. Um, but uh, the volume one got delayed several times. But uh, we're going to do our best to, to get it out this year before Christmas. How is it going to differ from Volume One? Uh, like like Josh mentioned, we kind of uh, now there's folklore in Volume Two. There's evidence in Volume One. It's there's a lot of crossover, but uh, in general, uh, Volume Two gets into a lot more of the I guess contemporary weirdness as opposed to just looking at at historical folklore, uh, and uh, may in fact be more controversial than Volume One. Yeah, you know, I I I I have I've really enjoyed volume 1, but uh volume 2 I think is going to be the one where we're taking a hard look at some of this stuff, especially like, you know, that sacred cow of cryptozoology, these Bigfoot prints and pointing out, you know, some of the inconsistencies um with some of these things. I'm really excited that we're, you know, we're also doing two case studies that are especially weird um, you know, suites of activity. Um, that have happened around some individuals who've had some some of all like hit are hit, ticking all the boxes throughout both volumes. Um, but also, you know, uh, Tim's talking about this disappearing evidence phenomena. The the lights, I think, is super important. Um, Hex signs talking about you know possibly the role of ritual magic in this. And you know, I'm really excited about uh, talking about altered states in Bigfoot because that gets a lot of attention uh, in the sort of fairy and UFO realms, but doesn't quite get the love that I think it should when people encounter Bigfoot and also have the sensation of being in an altered state as well. So yeah, we'll see. We'll see who we make mad. <laughs> I've told Tim many times that this, this feels like the first book I've ever written where I'm actually afraid that I'm making people mad a little bit, but you know, that's okay. Um, Push those yeah. boundaries, gentlemen. Push those boundaries. Timothy Renner, Joshua Cunchin, I look forward to getting you guys back on Spaced Out Radio. Thank you so much for taking the time to spend with us this evening. We really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having us. Absolute pleasure, Dave. Thanks so much. All right, gentlemen, you hold on for a quick second. We want to remind you, you can find Joshua and Tim's new book, Where the Footprints End, High Strangeness and the Bigfoot Phenomena, Volume 1, Folklore, out now, once again, on Amazon. You want to check this out. These are two great researchers, two great writers with honest opinions. Hard to find in this field, but we brought them to you on Spaced Out Radio. Coming up next, we have the SOR Newswire and the Thought of the Day. Stay tuned. Spaced Out Radio continues right after this. At SpacedOutRadio.com, we are keeping you up to date on all the news with the SOR Newswire. Captain Shirk leads the team that is bringing you the news of the day and exclusive stories on everything paranormal and supernatural. It's free to read, it's updated daily, and it's right there for you. The SOR Newswire is a one-stop shop for the news of the day. 
Check it out at spacedoutradio.com today. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache, so why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. Hey, Spaced Out Radio fans, it's John Rezig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. Our goal is to make the life of veterans, first responders, and those with rare medical conditions 10% happier. We do this by donating one grant item, ranging from dance to therapy programs to prosthetic limbs, to those who need it most. To contribute to Spaced Out Radio's official charity, head over to chivecharities.org and become a donor today. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. Need that weekend's supernatural fix? Look no further than Spaced Out Saturday right here at spacedoutradio.com. I'm Stacey Edwards. And I'm John Edwards. Each Saturday night, Stacey and I are going to bring you the best in paranormal, cryptids, UFOs, you name it, and we're going there. It's all about the experience and to share the knowledge with all of you. So tune us in every Saturday night on Spaced Out Saturdays starting at 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, only at spacedoutradio.com. Hey everybody, the SOR Space Travelers is open. For just five bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members-only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great forum for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com. Hello, space Travelers, it's me again, Carl. Don't forget to join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month and follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Our Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. Our Facebook page is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Come woo it up with Spaced Out Radio today. Bye. Are you looking for great advertising value for your company? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. We have a multitude of places to get your name out there, including commercial ads during the show, special promotions, and banners on our website. Our audience is proven to support the companies that support our show. We can make your budget work for you. So for more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. Cold drinks, great food, and the best music in Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is the place to be, open until 2 a.m. nightly. Everything on the menu starts at just $6.95. Who serves food that cheap anymore? At the Moose, you'll never know who you'll run into. Rock stars, actors, athletes, it's the place everyone wants to be. So join us at the Moose Vancouver, the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. If you like it hot, real hot, then heat up your meals with Bumblefoot Hot Sauce. Get your Bumblefoot Hot Sauce today. The sauce, Bumblelicious, and the 4 million Scoville unit, Bumble f- We're going in hot, real hot, coming out even hotter. Keep the milk nearby. 
and tantalize your taste buds tonight. Bubblefoot Hot Sauce, available now at kajans.com. You wanted new SOR gear, and now you can have it. The SOR Vault is fully stocked with t-shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and everything in between with great logos for you to choose from. So head on over to spacedoutradio.com, click on the SOR Vault, and go shopping. Pricing is quite affordable, and you can look good representing your favorite show. So go to our website and pick up your new SOR wear at the SOR Vault today. Hi there, this is the paranormal lawyer, Michael W. Hall. I'd like to invite you to listen in each Sunday night where we're going to open up your eyes to everything strange and paranormal. I will be hosting some great guests with topics that affect us all, such as UFOs, ghosts, and everything paranormal. Let's learn together on Spaced Out Radio Sunday with myself, Michael W. Hall, the paranormal lawyer at spacedoutradio.com. We've rounded third. We're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Really do appreciate you taking the time. I want to remind you that if you've missed most of this show or others, you can check out our free archives at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do me the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website, spacedoutradio.com, has a plethora of features for you, like rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Speaking of the news, guess what? It's that time. Hey, follow us on Twitter as well, at Spaced Out Radio for the show, and my personal handle, at Dave Scott SOR. The news is always changing, which is why we bring you the SOR Newswire at the back end of every show, where we get to the weird, the strange, the wacky, and sometimes those stories that just don't make sense. A court in Pakistan has released a donkey, yes, a donkey, that had been held following a case of illegal gambling. Eight men arrested in the same case were given bail the day after police targeted an illegal donkey race in a rural area in the south of Pakistan. The men had wagered bets on a challenge that the donkey could run three furlongs, or 600 meters, in 40 seconds. But there were illegal complications concerning the release of the donkey, which had been impounded by the police. I guess they were figuring the donkey may run for the border. Yeah, the story led to a flurry of media interest after reports that the donkey had been arrested and later granted bail. However, police say that the animal had simply been impounded for four days. Donkeys are frequently used as beasts of burden in rural areas of Pakistan, and betting on donkey cart races is not uncommon. The recent case occurred in the rural outskirts of the Pakistani area where police swooped in on the race before it began. Apart from the donkey, the officers also recovered from the scene a donkey cart, 121,000 rupees, which is about 740 bucks American, a cloth sheet spread on the ground on which the betting money was arranged, and a stopwatch. While the rest of the case of the property had been kept under a seal at the police lockup, the donkey spent its four days of captivity tied in a canda- cattle yard near the police station. The incident attracted local media interest and journalists were seen hanging around the cattle yard looking for a quote from the donkey, but they never got one. But they did get some good pictures and talk to police as well. The court handed custody of the donkey to its owner. Yes, yeah, Gula Mustafa, known by his alias Kaka, you can't write this, you can't make this up, on condition of safekeeping until the case was decided, when oxen were more in use in Pakistan several decades ago, they would often be impounded by police following a dispute over ownership. Happens far less these days, thank goodness, prompting reports in this case that the donkey had been formally detained. 
Sad news out of Montreal, where a wayward humpback whale that had enchanted Montrealers and drawn crowds near the city's old port appears to have died. The whale's lifeless body was seen drifting around the St. Lawrence River near Varennes, about 30 kilometers downstream from the city. Simon Lebrun, a maritime pilot, spotted the whale near Beauregard Island, posted a video on social media. Workers were eventually able to remove the whale, which could weigh as much as 12 tons, to shore to perform an, to perform a necropsy. The cause of the whale's death is not yet known. Robert Michaud, coordinator for the Quebec Marine Mammal Emergency Network, said he doesn't doubt that the whale in the video is the same one spotted by Montrealers last week. Michaud said a team will be on site to assess, uh, assist Fisheries and Oceans Canada and the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine at the University University rather of Montreal. According to me showed it was the first time a humpback whale made its way into Montreal waters. It was first spotted in the city on May 30th near the Jacques Cartier Bridge and was last seen swimming near Pointe aux Trembles on Sunday. Oh, that's too bad. Too bad. All right, let's move on here. If your child is a fan of Paw Patrol, the cartoon Oh, yeah, you don't want to mention that in public anymore right now. Not right now. Temporarily, I hope. Paw Patrol is facing backlash for its depiction of police. The Nickelodeon children's cartoon posted a tweet in support of Black Lives Matter in the wake of the international protests last week. While the sentiment was in the right place, many are calling for the cancellation of the fictional police dog named Chase. He frequently says Chase is on the case and all in a police pup's day as he goes about being a hero along with the rest of his crime fighting rescue animals. Instantly, commentators who apparently had nothing better to do than to rip a cartoon on social media started joking about the postings like euthanize the police dog and defund the Paw Patrol. One person even went as far as to post all dogs go to heaven except the class traitors in the Paw Patrol. While there are a lot of jokes about Paw Patrol, there are also several people who would like to see the children's show Ditch Chase the Police Dog. The Chase cancellation news comes after Paramount Television canceled the long-running series of Cops after 33 years, and A&E has also temporarily canceled their wildly popular Live PD. One Paw Patrol critic tried to hit Nickelodeon where it hurts most by saying Chase merchandise Going to sell poorly now, another critic declared, you've already brainwashed a bunch of kids into thinking law enforcement is a noble and just profession. Better to scrap production forever if you want to make that lasting change. Things are getting pretty heated for Paw Patrol at the moment, which is something that nobody saw coming in 2020. But oddly, it makes too much sense at the moment. Do we even really want to know what's coming next? As the Paw Patrol backlash continues, further examination of fictional TV cops have come under the microscope. Tom Sharpling, an executive producer for Monk, called out his own show, stating, If you, as I have, worked on a TV show or movie in which the police are portrayed as lovable goofballs, you have contributed to the larger acceptance that cops are implicitly the good guys. Shows like Brooklyn Nine-Nine and Blue Bloods have donated to Black Lives Matter organizations, while Lego has halted production and sales of their Lego police station and police highway arrests, highway arrest sets. You can uh, check out the Paw Patrol tweet if you uh, go on to at Paw Patrol on Twitter. Yes. Yes. Do what you will with that one. The San Diego County Sheriff's Office said deputies responded to a 911 call about 4.30 in the morning reporting two cars driving recklessly in Lemon Grove. The deputies then attempted to stop the vehicles, but both sped off in a high-speed chase from the scene, the department says. Deputies called off the chase out of safety concerns before one of the vehicles actually crashed into the backyard of a house. What happened? Well, the vehicle ended up submerged in the pool. No word if the drivers was wearing their, their swimming cap and goggles. Maybe a snorkel would help at this time, but... Either way, no injuries were reported. 
A woman attempting to get a document notarized in a flooded area of New Orleans ended up getting a lift from a man in a canoe. It's actually kind of a cool story, you know, because nobody likes that flooding. Flooding is dangerous. Dan Crowley said he decided to take his canoe to check out the flooding in his neighborhood when he spotted Natasha Godin struggling to walk through the knee-deep flood waters. Godin said she was carrying an important paper to a nearby home of a lawyer to be notarized. Crowley offered Godin a ride and lifted her into his canoe when he then paddled her to the lawyer's house. Crowley and Godin said they were strangers before the encounter, but they were able to talk on the boat ride and instantly became good friends. Several roads in New Orleans flooded this week due to heavy rains from tropical storm Cristobal. I don't get this one. Oh, my goodness. I seriously do not get this one. How does this even happen? I don't want to know. All I got to say is this has got to hurt. It's got to hurt. There's got to be, you know, a sense of pain when this happens that is unbearable. A Chinese man was rushed to hospital after he was hacked on his head with a meat cleaver during a heated row. What's a heated row? Well, let's find out. Viral images and footage show the unnamed patient covered in blood while the steel blade is stuck deep in his skull at an A&E department in Hubei province. The man is gradually recovering in hospital after undergoing an operation to remove the cleaver. Police are investigating the incident. Oh, this is just horrible. Yeah, the horrific scene occurred this past Monday at the Chongyang People's Hospital in, in, in the Hubei province. The incident was revealed by Chinese media after the images and video became viral. The patient is said to have been attacked after getting into a fight with someone the county hospital said. A doctor said the man had a successful operation and was in stable condition. Local police told the press that they were investigating the incident, but the officers didn't receive any reports related to the man's injury. No? Why isn't anybody replying to this? Earlier this week, what is happening in China? Earlier this week, another Chinese man walked into the hospital with a crossbow arrow bolt in his chest it looks like it went right through his heart my goodness anyways he he accidentally shot himself while cocking the weapon the young man known by his pseudonym Xiao Peng miraculously dodged death after the arrow missed his heart by just 0.2 inches oh my goodness Yeah, he had been recovering in local hospital after receiving a successful operation. Why do they have to use the word successful there? Obviously, it's successful if he's recovering. Anyways, media reports did not specify the length of the quarrel, but a crossbow bolt is typically about 20 inches long. Footage shows Yao Peng with the bolt protruding from his body after the incident took place on Saturday. A doctor removed the weapon, just slid right out. Of course, because it's a clean shot. The injury was quite severe. He was lucky, uh, very lucky, despite all the unfortunates the media was told. I mean, what is happening there? All right, let's move on here. Let's stick in China for a quick second here. A horizontal skyscraper in China opened up its first attraction to the public, a glass-bottom observation deck 820 feet over the ground. The crystal, which is known as the horizontal skyscraper, that stretches across the tops of four out of the eight skyscrapers that make up the Raffles City Chongqing Complex, opened the exploration deck to the public this week as COVID-19 lockdown regulations were loosened. The crystal, which features aerial walkways connected it to two other the buildings, was designed by Moshi Safti from the Capital Land Group real estate organization. The exploration desk, created in partnership with National Geographic, features exhibits based around space travel. The exhibition brings to life space exploration through five multidimensional exhibition zones, 
at the exploration deck on level 47 and showcases how mankind is making life possible on Mars. The tour ends at an indoor park featuring a glass bottom observation deck. The crystal is planned to eventually also include a members only private club and a restaurant with a bar. Oh, isn't that good? Because you always need a bar in those situations. Yeah, let's see if we could crack this glass, right? Is it just me? Is it just me? Mm. Moving on. One final story. A distillery in Australia said a recall successfully recovered all gin bottles that were mistakenly sold as liquor, but were actually filled with hand sanitizer. The Apollo Bay Distillery in Victoria said nine bottles labeled SS Casino Gin were sold during the weekend at the Great Ocean Road Brew House in Apollo Bay. The distillery said the bottles were mistakenly put up for sale as gin, but were actually filled with hydrogen peroxide and glycerol or glycerol, pardon me, a spokesperson said the bottles were identifiable by the lack of a seal or shrink wrapping. Luckily, nobody drank it. Great clown today, Marty. Fantastic clown. Thought of the day happens every night at this time where we ask a question on our Facebook and Twitter pages. Then read your responses on the air because we love the audience participation around here. Today's thought of the day is as follows. If Dogman and Sasquatch were to step into the wrestling ring, who wins? I told you earlier, Iron Sheik leads Bigfoot to victory. Oh yeah, if I'm stepping into the squared circle, I want the Iron Sheik in my corner. Marty says, depends on if biting is allowed. If it does go by strength, Sasquatch will win by sheer brute force as he could tear Dogman apart. But if Dogman isn't muzzled, he wins. Those canine teeth are the great equalizers in the cryptid world. One. That's a little like a fight between Martell and the Mountain in Game of Thrones. Dogman has the skills, and it will be a close call. But in the end, Bigfoot's brute force will win the day. Oh, yeah. That's 2-0 for Bigfoot. Let's move on. Let's get to Gutter. Gutter says, third round, Dogman launches last attempt super kick, but Sasquatch counters with a jackknife powerbomb for the win. Oh, that's a nice move. Very painful. That's a nice move, though. Good for him. All right, let's see what everybody else has to say here. Uh, let's see. Jack says, the real winner is the audience. Okay. Matthew, Sasquatch, win by prying Dogman's jaw open and splitting it. Kelly, Sasquatch would win with the camel clutch. Little known fact, the Iron Sheik is actually a shaved Bigfoot. You got that right, Kelly. Another Kelly, Sasquatch, because Sasquatch brought doggy biscuits and Dogman sat and was a good boy for his treat. Tim, Bigfoot by the sheer strength, ripping the jaws of the Dogman in two. Anything that can pull up tree stumps out of the ground and turn them upside down is intense. Nathan, I'm not sure, but it would have to be a best out of three falls match. No disqualification. I want to see that. You know, let's take that one step forward, man. One step further. Let's put him in a steel cage. This has to be a cage match. Hell in the cell type style. Put the roof on it. We got to see this. I want blood. I want ladders. I want steel chairs. You know, I want poison ivy from the forest. I want big logs. All right. Yeah. And maybe a couple of honey badgers just to dip at their ankles. To get them really pissed off. Let's do this. We need to make this happen. Where's Dana White when we need him? Gail, Sasquatch would win. He'd pick Dogman up and beat him senseless because Dogman is the quintessential all bark and no bite kind of cryptid. Dan, Bigfoot wins by disqualification. When he goes to pin Dogman, Slenderman comes in with a chair. Oh my goodness. And attacks Bigfoot from behind, disqualifying Dogman. 
I think Macho Man Randy Savage held on to the Intercontinental Championship because of that. Yeah, that's a good call. Good call. James, beef jerky and doggy treats aside, I see Bigfoot winning using his telepathic maneuvers and knowing Dogman's next move. Game over, dog breath. Let's go to Filth. Dogman takes it because Jesse Ventura distracts Carl, the referee, as Sasquatch is about to deliver. The wood knock finishing move. Dogman finishes a foreign object or fishes a foreign object out of his trunks at low blow Sasquatch. The body stops distracting the ref and then Dogman uses his dog collar choke slam and gets the pin. But wait! Here comes Commissioner Dave Scott running down to the ringside, but the body and dogman flee through the crowd, and Commissioner Scott declares a rematch. By God, it's a slobber knocker! John! Dogman starts quick and avoids Sassy's lumbering attacks. He uses his speed and a barrage of top rope attacks to bewilder the Sasquatch, but just as Sasquatch is down on one knee and wearing the crimson mask, a low rumble of wood knocks starts to erupt from the audience. As Sasquatch hears the knocks, he starts Sasquatching up. Dogman is not deterred and uses his finisher of the Bulldog Man headlock. He covers for the one, two grunts and wood knocks, and the big primal howl kicks out. Sasquatch stands up. Dogman throws a paw, and Sasquatch blocks it. Points it at Dogman and says, well, we don't know what the heck he'll say because you have to be a special kind of crazy to think you know what Bigfoot language is. Sasquatch unloads a few huge shots and then shoots the mutt into the ropes for the Bigfoot to the snout. Dogman falls. Sasquatch covers one, two, three. Your winner, Sasquatch. And Salmo, no one. Bigfoot saved Dogman's life at the end. Preston, oh boy, now I'm picturing Dave Scott, Rich Giordano, and Art Keith Andrews doing the commentary. And that's a good place to leave it on the thought of the Dave tonight. Thank you for your imagination. That was absolutely stunning. And, of course, we'll do it all again tomorrow on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks, Captain Shirk, for a wonderful round of news tonight. And to Joshua Cutchin and Timothy Renner for their big new book coming out on Bigfoot. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thaw rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, in your cars, at work, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone participating in our chat rooms on Spreaker. LGAB, Revolution Radio, Facebook, the SOR Space Travelers Club on our website, YouTubers, you were fantastic, and to all the Starkers and Starkets on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. We love you so much. Please remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us, because together, my friends... We own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Remember, everybody, the Wu train may have parked for the night, but we will fire it up again tomorrow. Your tickets never expire. Your seats are always available. And if you want to bring some friends, we got room for them as well. Have a great night. See you tomorrow night. Good night.